The one I keep is always here. Okay, we will be live. The one I keep is always here. Okay, we will be live. Did I lose you all? We're Hello? still here, look we're here, Lori. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's gone real quiet and I thought, well come, maybe I'm the only one here. <laughs> we're waiting for Andrew to take us live. <laughs> okay. You are live, sir. All right. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm calling this meeting to order. This is a special meeting of the Board of Trustees of the Canute Independent School District. Uh, today is January 20th, 2021. Meeting was scheduled for three, is now 3.11 p.m. Uh, and so, Sonia, would you please call roll? Yes, sir. Mr. Coronado. Here. Mr. Hernandez. Here. Mrs. Mendoza. Here. Mr. Payan. Here. Mr. Rodriguez. Present. Mrs. Searles. Here. And Mrs. Trout? Present. Thank you, trustees. All right, thank you, Sonia. So uh, just for everybody's knowledge, on uh, March 16th of last year, Governor Greg Abbott um, granted a request by the Attorney General, Ken Paxson, to temporarily suspend a limited number of open meetings laws to the extent necessary to allow telephone or video conference meetings in response to the coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic. And so in accordance with these suspended rules, we certify the following, that notice of this meeting has been posted online for at least 72 hours. Although members of the board are not gathered in a central physical location, we do have quorum in attendance at this meeting by telephone call and internet access. So we are meeting by use of both telephone conference call, online access, and through the use of an email link. For questions. If a member of the public submitted written comments in advance, we will uh, read those comments in the record before or during the board's consideration of the items. Uh, if you would like to provide comment at a future meeting conducted by video conference or telephone call, please follow the instructions on the meeting notice, as will be done for the regular board meeting next week. All other meeting procedures will adhere to the board adopted procedures to the extent practical. And an audio recording of this meeting is, be, is being made and will be made available to the public at a later date. If you have any questions about these suspended laws, please call the Office of the Attorney General at 888-672-6787 or by email at capital T-O-M-A at oag.texas.gov. All right. That takes us now to business. Uh, open forum. Yes, sir. 
Any member of the community wishing to make a comment during open forum can send their comments to the following email address, boardquestions at ganutioisd.org. Comments must be submitted prior to the meeting start time. The board is not permitted to discuss or act upon any issues that are not posted on the agenda for tonight's meeting. All right, do we have any submitted? No, sir. Comments? No, sir. All right. Okay, then that takes us to the next agenda item. Yes, sir. Item number three, training workshop. Trustees will participate in a team building workshop. The workshop, the workshop must include a review of the roles, rights, and responsibilities of the local board as outlined in the framework for governance leadership and an assessment of continuing education needs of the board slash superintendent team. All right. Thank you, Sonia. And we want to welcome uh, Mr. Cinto Ramos from... Uh, Leadership ISD for our training today. Good uh, afternoon, Mr. Ramos. Good afternoon, President Coronado. All right, so uh, you will be uh, leading the uh, team, uh, I guess the, the team training workshop for us today. Uh, you also have somebody else that will be online with, uh, by a video conference, is that correct? That's correct. So I'd like to take the, the time to note she's with us. Uh, our CEO of Leadership ISD, uh, Patricia Arvanides. All right, and is she on the line? I am. All right, we wanna welcome Patricia. Really? Welcome to our meeting. Thank and you. thank you all for uh, doing this uh, workshop for us. All right. Um, and um, so who's going to start the uh, the workshop, and Mr. Ramos. Actually, it is now, Doctor. Not yet. Not yet? You still? We're still waiting on that, Mr. Ramos. Pretty soon, I hope. All right. Okay. Take it away. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, ISD. It is a pleasure to be with you all, and as you as you just heard. Um, Myself and, and the CEO of, of Leadership ISD is, uh, are happy to be with you to facilitate this team of eight training. Um, I'm going to um, ask Patricia to introduce herself uh, and, and what the organization is about that we all get a feel for who we are and why we're here with you. Thanks, Cinto. Um, good evening. Uh, thank you for having us this evening. I'm excited to be with you. Uh, so as Cinto said, I am the CEO and founder of Leadership ISD. Um, Leadership ISD has been around for about 10 years. Uh, in fact, this is our 10th year in 2021. And we are an organization that was designed to connect the community to our board table uh, in order to advance outcomes and experiences for students um, with a particular focus on closing opportunity gaps uh, across districts in Texas. Um, our belief is that every child can thrive and we, all of us, the collective we, um, hold our districts accountable to pro that promise. Um, and so we have worked with our community, we work with school boards, we work with uh, leaders and uh, educational leaders in order to build uh, a foundation where all of us are held accountable for our, the success of our students. Um, so we are excited to be here with you this evening um, as we work with you and your district to, to move forward. All right, thank you. Patricia, and my name is Azinto Ramos Jr. I'm, as is noted, uh, part of the leadership by Z team. I'm also currently serving as the president of Fourth Independent School District um, in various roles throughout the state and the country uh, with some friendly faces uh, from, from Cano Tio and from the El Paso area. So we'll we'll jump right in to give you a brief overview of what we're going to be talking, what we're going to be covering today. We're going to do an opening activity in a minute, so we'll uh, we'll go through that uh, to describe how we're going to facilitate that part. We're going to talk about some agreements. Um, we're, what, what we do with our team of eight is uh, we incorporate bring a sense of community, uh, the sense of collaborative uh, workspaces. That, that entails creating a set of agreements that would be particular to Gunnel DOISD. 
and um, will be a tool for you to use if you so choose. And I'll show you some examples of what that looks like in a little bit as well. Uh, we're going to talk about shifting from safe spaces to brave spaces. Uh, we believe that uh, young people deserve the absolute best. Um, and if you're familiar with anything with, uh, with the Lone Star Governance model, uh, the motto is the student outcomes won't change until adult behaviors change. Uh, the research is riddled with um, behaviors that lead to higher student outcomes. And how so team made in your case, by creating a brave space means that. I really can't hear you, Jacinto. Sorry. Um, so you're fading in and out. Are y'all, can y'all mute on y'all? No. Are, are y'all muted? Yeah, let me mute my. How's it sound now? Better. Uh, better. Okay. Uh huh. Yeah. So we're going to talk about create what it looks like to create a brave space to be able to lean into a uh, real healthy dialogue uh, to, to, to push for better student outcomes. Uh, we're going to, if we have time, we'll address mental models, which we'll get to that as well. And then we definitely want to hopefully be able to get to expectations. What are expectations that you have of, of each other? What are expectations you have of your officers? Uh, what are expectations you have of your superintendent? And uh, hopefully we'll create a healthy dialogue around that. Uh, any questions before we begin from any board members or superintendent? Okay. So my friends, there are three words that we're going to um, make sure that we have a common language on, which it's discussion, dialogue, and debate. Uh, discussion is what I'm doing right now. I'm, I'm doing the talking. I'm assuming that everyone is paying attention and grasping uh, what we're going to be talking about. That's a discussion. Um, a, in the dialogue is a mutual exchange. It's a back and forth. Uh, it's it's uh, hopefully where I'm listening to you from zero, that I'm willing to empty my mind and and listen to you with an open heart and open mind. Um, and it's not necessarily about winning or losing or that you're, that, that you, it's not, it's not about winning or losing. It's about creating a sense of mutual ex exchange. The third one is debate. Uh, and debate is a winner and a loser. Um, I'm gonna try to get my point across and I'm going to hopefully get the victory on this vote. If we're gonna have a vote tonight, um, I wanna be on the winning end of that. And so I'm gonna debate it out with you to try to get that point across. Question to you kind of through ISD is um, what what kind of feelings, and I'm, and I'm gonna say feelings because I wanna know, I want you all to be able to discuss about what does it look like, what does it feel like when you're having these conversations in kind of deal. So what are kind of feelings come to mind when you're having a discussion? In other words, uh, you're being spoken to and you're not necessarily maybe being asked for your input. What kind of feelings come up when you think about being in a discussion? And, and as my facilitator friends say, I'll wait. <laughs> Anybody on the board? Uh, discussions. I feel pretty confident. Um, in the Good. And that, I think, is due to the leadership of our board president. Thank you. What kind of feelings come up when you think about having a dialogue with someone, a mutual exchange of information? I'll go first on that. And in, in regards to dialogue, I, I think it depends on the topic, right, or what might be the agenda item. But I think uh, we had a dialogue at the last meeting in regards to student outcomes, and I think it was very healthy, uh, the board discussion that we had centered around that, so. Thank you, sir. What about when you have a debate with someone, what kind of feelings come up for you when you're having a debate? Well, I, I, I can, I can uh, try and address some of this. It depends on 
you know, also what the discussion is about. Obviously, some people feel very passionate about certain things. And so when, when having a debate, if it's something that um, they're trying to convince somebody else, or you're trying to bring your point across in a counter, you may feel uneasy about how it's being received, or you may not be thinking how your manner or your style of getting your point across is coming to the other board members. So that's why you maybe think that you are making a uh, direct comment, it might seem uh, antagonistic. So, or you may feel like you need to be antagonistic because somebody else made something that you don't agree with. So there's a lot going on when you're doing a debate. Thank you. Patricia, anything to, to add my friend? Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting. I know um, I'd be curious to hear how you guys um, react when that, when those uh, conversations are between like the board president and the board or when the superintendent talks to the board or, you know, do you feel different about a discussion or a debate or a dialogue uh, depending on who is leading that? Um, is there positional power that, that drips into your conversation um, that makes you react differently to, to those types of conversations? Uh, for instance, I know that for me, sometimes when I am working with uh, my team, our team, um, I like to have a dialogue, but and oftentimes I slip into discussion because I slip into this where I feel like I'm talking at my team and not talking with my team. And so I'd be curious to, to if you are feeling any elements around that in your conversations. Anybody? In regards to our board meetings, um, I think we've been able to have dialogue. I think sometimes uh, we, we've pretty much either through LSG or some of the other trainings we've had is, is to really um, uh, what, are, what is the word? The, um, constraints. We have some of the constraints that I think has allowed for um, more of if you need to do research on one of the agenda items, you have those questions with staff. And so I think our, our board meetings have been streamlined over the years. Previously, we used to have committee, a committee structure, which back then you would have a discussion in one committee, let's say finance, and you would throw it to HR because it was dealing with salaries or, or you know, the increase in, in uh, the budget for for that. So it would be bounced back and forth. And then, you know, sometimes you would be at a board meeting and say, let's bounce it back to the committee. So I think we've streamlined it. And I think our meetings are, are a little bit more streamlined in regards to um, that that dialogue and <clears throat> so and so that's you know that's the reason why we're we're beginning with this portion is um, there are definitely times for discussion there are times for debate and yet what we would propose is that a healthy dialogue might get us further along uh, if if I am willing to listen to uh, one of my colleagues on my board and they're willing to listen to me and maybe we can find better solutions. Um, so we'll get that started. We're gonna do an activity. Um, so I'm gonna uh, ask you all to, to take note of the prompts that are on the screen. Um, and so I'm gonna ask you to pair up. Dr. Galavis, you're, you're also gonna participate, my friend, a team of eight, right? So uh, we're gonna want you to go through these list of questions, um, interview um, one of your colleagues, um, and uh, I know Trustee Searles, you're joining us via phone. So 
hopefully um, we can have you connect with someone on the phone uh, to to re to go over these questions. And what I want to ask you is that, that you have a good dialogue and in interviewing this person. Uh, feel free to inquire, ask more questions. You know, that's interesting. Tell me more about that, that kind of scenario. Um, and then really take good notes because when we come back and we're going to give you 15 to 20 minutes, depending on how long it takes. Um, we're going to ask you when we come back and reconvene, you're going to introduce your friend and your colleague uh, to the rest of us um, based on these prompts. And if you get extra information, by all means, we'd love to hear it. Uh, but at, at least at the minimum, try to get try to get these questions answered. So just to make sure we're on the same page, the first questions are, what is your full name? Does it have meaning in your family? Where were you born? Where were your parents or guardians born? Uh, what are your top five cultural identities? Um, so I'll give you an example. Mine are um, a man of faith, uh, husband, uh, culture of fathers, uh, culture of Mexican descent, uh, and culture of I love going camping. So I, I hang out with that kind of folk, that, that, those kinds of folks. Uh, so it's most people tend to want to go just, you know, the racial lens, the ethnic lens, but uh, it's, it's what cultures do you subscribe to? What are your top five identities? I uh, want you to talk about your ed educational experience. What was the most positive life-changing memory that you have of school that you recall? Uh, why did you choose to run and serve on this board? And for the superintendent is why did you choose to apply and lead at Canotio ISD? So whoever interviews Dr. Galavis, you'll, you'll be able to hear from him and then you'll tell us about him. Uh, what special skill, talent, or strength do you bring to the team of eight? And finally, what have you enjoyed most about being part of this team of eight? And I know that uh, Tristan just joined and I think Patsy as well, right? Uh, so looking forward to hearing about, uh, about these two human beings as well. Um, so do you all have a preference on how you want to pair up? Um, I think we've got three people joining us uh, virtually. I know we've got four people here. Would it be okay if I suggest that um, the two of you team up and then Mondo, you and Tristan might be in the same area, same vicinity? Uh, I think that would leave uh, Blanca and, and um, Salvador. Would y'all mind connecting either via That's okay. That's yep. fine. Great. Yep. And then um, Dr. Galaviz, would you and uh, Trustee Searles connect to review these? Yes, sir. Okay. Certainly. All righty. Well, it is 3.30. Um, so we'll, shoot, we'll shoot for 3.45, 3.50 at the latest. We'll see you in a bit. Okay. Hi, Dr. Galaviz. Hey, Ms. Searles. How are you? Staying warm? I'm wonderful. How are you? What are we going to do? It's freezing. Absolutely. Hopefully they're getting good snow. Are you going to Utah? Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, and I, ha I don't know. I haven't looked at the ski, the ski reports. Thank you. That's something I need to do. Yes. Mm. Is, that, is that your birthday present? No, no. We'll go later. Oh. We'll go later. But thank you for asking. All right, Ms. So, Rose. Do you want what? me to interview you first or you me? I'll interview. So you, you have the PowerPoint, right? Yeah, I got it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me do you first. Ready? Okay. Yeah, I'm ready. What is your full name? Laurie Searles. You have no middle name? Well, yes, but I don't ever use it. Oh. So, I, yeah, I, I kind of drop it. I don't know why. Dr. Alavis. Yes, sir. Hey, uh, I was trying <laughs> to, how, how do I connect with uh, Blanca? Oh, is she calling you? Might be calling you. Oh, she's gonna call me. Okay. She's on the phone with somebody. She's gonna call you, Mr. Bayam. Yeah. So does your does your um, na name have no. any meaning? No. No. I mean, probably to my children it does, but you know, no one else. Well, what's no, what's so, um, what nationality is Cyril's? I don't know. I guess Irish. Irish? Aaron Gobra? Yeah. I would where, say Irish. Where were you born? Florida. No 
Florida. Parents, New York. Both five mom and dad? Cult- yeah. Five cultural identities. I'd say God-fearing wife, mother, citizen, Hispanic. Is that five? One, two. That's five. Okay, I'll go with those five. Most positive, life-changing memory of school? You know, I'd have to say it was my fourth grade teacher. And I was a very precocious third grader and told the teacher I didn't want to be in her class anymore. I needed to go to the fourth grade. I didn't want to be in the third grade. And after not much time, Mrs. Carmen Salcedo said, she was the fourth grade teacher, she said she would be happy to take me. (laughs) So I moved on up to the fourth grade. And she is, I still, she's the kindest, most wonderful. You know, I just learned so much from her. And her brother was a bullfighter. And that made it exciting on top of her very calm and sweet personality. You know, there were, she would bring stories of the bullfights from Spain. And it it was very exciting, yet very, she was just such a lovely person. She made you want to go to school. So how long did you stay in third grade? Oh, about two weeks. Wow. (laughs) So that was, it's. Mrs. Salcedo is my my positive life changing memory of school. She just made you so happy. So, so what, was, what was I guess what was wrong with the third grade teacher? Oh, she was fine. I just I didn't think they were. I, I thought I needed to be with someone who was teaching more than they were learning. Oh, wow. Two weeks. Mm -hmm. I knew I didn't belong in that class, and I got up and told the teacher I didn't belong in the class. I needed to go to the fourth grade. (laughs) Much to my mother's probably shock. She had no idea I was thinking that. But they did. They put me up, and it was after like two weeks. Could have been three at the most. And Mrs. Salcedo just made... She was just so wonderful. Uh, And you're... So you go, you go home and you say, hey, mom, I don't belong in third grade. I don't want to be here. No, I think the principal called probably. Mm-hmm. And her response was okay, sure? Mm-hmm. Yeah, she was okay with that. Uh-huh. So why did you choose to run and serve? I was asked to. And all I did was go to central office, and Patsy Mendoza will remember this. I wrote my name down, and I went home. And that was the end of the story. They called me and said, you won. And that was in, I believe, 1993. Who asked you, Miss Earl? You know, everyone... The teachers, parents, students, custodians. uh, It was so, you know, it was really interesting. Very, very, uh, you know, I said, sure, I will. So no no campaigning, no billboards? No, No, nothing. No. (laughs) No, I didn't, no. Mm -mm. Nothing. In fact, I didn't even know the next day they called from the school district to tell me I won. I didn't even watch the news that night. No. I figured it was in God's hands. If I'd won, I'd won. If I hadn't, well, I hadn't. And somebody else would. So now it's 2021. Yeah. Why do you continue this journey? Because I'm asked. Because what, ma'am? I'm asked. A-S-K-E. Okay. Still asked. (laughs) 
by the same people to run. So why do, why do you think they feel that need to have Miss Laurie Searles with, with the middle name that I don't know? I don't know why they do, but they must, and I feel happy to oblige. Oh. Cool. Next one. What special skill, talent, or strength do you bring to the team of eight? Heck, Dr. Galavis, I don't know. <laughs> what do you think? I, mean, I don't know. Um, yeah. I don't know. I, I think you, you bring rationale and practicality in a complex system called school. That's very nice, Dr. Gellies. Then that'll be the answer. I think. Okay, okay we'll have that for the answer, because I really don't know. I, uh, I guess I, I really don't know. Yeah, you, you're well, someone. You know, and what I think, too, is maybe I bring some history. which is sometimes good and, you know. His story? Good. Yes, his story. Thank you. You mean her story? Yes. And then the last one, what have you enjoyed most about being part of this team of eight? Well, Dr. Galavis, that's a hard one because we've only been this team of eight for two meetings. So, well, let me ask it in a different way. Okay. What do you What do you hope to like most? What do you hope for? You know, and that's hard too, because of COVID. I hate to say that, and you know, have an excuse. I I don't. I've tried not to get high hopes, and I want to tell you, this is not to do with this question, but to do with you once again. I told this to Jimmy today. You never, we drove past Damian, kids were out in the play yard playing. You have never once stepped left or right. You've stayed straight on with doing what is best for kids through this. You have been amazing. So I really, I can't tell you. It has made me feel so confident. And that's a good thing. So that I, I needed to tell you that. I think this quite often, and I don't think I tell you quite near enough. But I guess being this team of eight, how about we've had two very peaceful meetings? Two peaceful meetings. Maybe that's the wrong thing. That means there must have been something wrong in the past. Let's not use that. How about... Uh, Like getting to know the dynamics of a new board and working with new, you know, new board members. That'll be good. All right. Okay. So what is your full name? It's Pedro Galavis, and I was named after my mother's father. Now, see, when we go forward, I asked, did my name mean anything? It doesn't. But all of our boys have, like you do, named after mother's father, father's mother's father, you know, that type of mm -hmm. stuff. Okay, so you're your mother's Yeah, my grandfather. Father. Yeah. Yes. Your maternal grandfather. grandfather. I was born in Wisconsin. Did you know him? No, I've never met him. Did he pass away before you came? Yes, ma'am. I only knew my grandmother. I only knew one grandparent. Yeah, me too. Okay, but you never knew him. Did you see pictures yeah. of him? I saw pictures of him. Did you like what you saw? Uh, no, because he was the old pictures they had of him. He was older. I never saw like you know a picture when he was younger or a baby or. Okay, so he was a pretty old guy when the pictures... Yeah, he was an old guy.
Did you like your grandmother? No, she was mean. She didn't. Okay. She didn't. She didn't like my 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 dad. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> oh, so, that's a good one, Doctor Calavis. So, yeah, she was always. Uh, was it? I don't know why. Never. I only met her like a couple times. Not a lot. So. What'd she call you? Uh, they call me, uh, it's called Perucha. Mm -hmm. and I don't know what it meant, just made a nickname. But that's what she would call you? Yeah. Okay. And did everybody call you that? Uh, yeah, mostly my mom and dad. Do you want me to say that to anyone? Suppose somebody oh, starts care. calling you that again. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So where were you born? I was born in Wisconsin. Okay. Jeez, I, was, I was born in a, in a manger. I thought so. <laughs> <laughs> now both my parents, huh? Your folks? They were both born in Mexico. Okay. Where, Dr. Galvis? Uh, my dad was born in, it, it's called Palau. Palau. Allah, tell me the rest yeah. of it. P A L A L U, like Palau, Palau. Oh, I understand that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And my mother was born in, it's called Camargo. C A M. Oh yeah, I know where Camargo is. Yeah. Uh huh. So, what are your top five cultural ideas? Uh, God. Yes, sir. Um, I put husband, father, family, God, family. Um, I, uh, U.S. of A. God, family, cheesehead. Okay. Let's say God, family. You got no? six, but it's okay. Oh. Because husband, father, family could be one. Okay. Okay. So, educational experience. Your most positive life-changing memory of school. I think I think Miss Uran. She was when when we were migrants up north. She would always watch out for us in school. Cause she knew my older brother and she used to bring um and father heffron too because he used to bring us clothes okay from the, was father from the, heffron from the school or from yeah, father heffron was from the school because we got we got to go to a catholic school because we cleaned the schools uh-huh because of dr murphy who also had a he had a big family also he had a family of 12. Mm -hmm. And so we, he, uh, he allowed, or he talked to the parish, and then that was how we paid our tuition. Okay. Didn't you get a good education, too? Oh, yeah, I loved Catholic school. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, we used to have a board member, Charlie Hecker, and he was all about Catholic school. But one thing he used to always bring to the board was that we should really teach Latin in school. He said everything falls in place. He said in Catholic school, they, did you learn Latin in Catholic school? Yeah, we learned. Yeah. We had a class. Yeah. And he said everything, he pushed so hard for that for so many years. Obviously, we didn't do it, but I thought that was interesting. So Father Heffron and Dr. Murphy and Miss Uran, she's watching out for you. Yeah. Dr. Murphy talked to Father Heffron and got tuition granted. Yes. And then Miss Heffron, Miss, I was in, because uh, I didn't do well on those placement tests, so I was always put in, uh, or we're, me personally, I was put in uh, those remedial classes. And then Miss Heffron, used, I mean, Miss, Miss, um, not Miss Heffron, Father Heffron. You Ms. Miss Uran. Miss, yeah, Miss Uran. Um, as you can tell, we had fun with her name. Um, she used to 
go to the counselor and say, why did you put this young man in, in remedial biology or remedial algebra? And that time, my older brothers and sisters at that time were in law school, medical school. And he goes, do you know this family? And, da, 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 and, and put them in and then, and so, so she would always push, push she would always check. She was your advocate, yeah. Yeah, she was my advocate. And so do you think that going to parochial school, because you have a really smart family, your family has done unbelievably well. Do you think that that, that was the push or maybe the bridge, the, you know, was there a connection? Yeah, I think for, for me, the connection was that there, it, I didn't never realize my and I didn't I didn't I never identified myself as poor or Mexican or migrant. I didn't label yeah. there's no labels. Yeah, we all, it was nice, wasn't it? We were all part of God's family. And I really was, like that. Yeah, we never did either. It wasn't there was you know Yeah. But do you think that because I know there's just no doubt in my mind that at Catholic school you learn a lot you're never going to learn in public school. Yeah, and then it was more about even for testing we did we did more of the um, yeah. IT, ITBS like more yeah. fourth grade eighth grade. Also to, discipline. Yeah, discipline. You know, shirts tucked in. Yeah, uniform. Like, yeah. Right. Yeah, strict and rigid. Do you think those things made a difference? Yeah, I think those things, but also the 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 um, the, the you know, going to church. The love that came with the strict and rigid. Yeah, well, going to yeah. church and learning the Bible is the best book in the world, and you, no one can recant or those stories. They're just it's better in Disney World. Aren't they though? I keep, yes, I agree. Okay, so why did you, this is hilarious, why did you choose to apply and lead at DeSoto ISD when I saw this? That's what mine says. I thought, oh. you mean you're leaving to go to DeSoto, <laughs> Dr. Kelly? Oh, yeah. Okay, so why did you choose to apply to Canyon Teal? I think, you know what, I didn't know where it was at first. Mm -hmm. One of the one of the things when I was looking, my kids made me promise because um, there's a school district outside of San Antonio, um, and it it didn't have a Walmart. It was kind of kind of like a Fort Stockton out in the uh -huh. boonies. Not even Fort Stockton had more, and my. Kids made me promise, making sure that they had a Walmart, they had some sort, sort of like a big city, if you will. Uh -huh. And and it was um, people that from Round Rock that and that told me about Canotillo and say, hey, you're gonna love that city. It's on the west side of El Paso. It's a great community, and you know, El Paso so great. And and my plus my sister was district attorney here. Yeah. And and. And so that's the reason how I got to know El Paso, because when we would drive from Wisconsin, we'd take a take a right in Austin, yeah, and shoot out or Dallas, take that whatever that angle is, and come out here and visit her. And but when she was here, I think Sunlin was considered way west, because there was nothing yeah. behind, nothing <laughs> by Sunlin. But and then yeah, when I met you, crazy. and then like I said, you know, you, Miss Patsy and Armando are kind of like my first prom dates, you know. Mm -hmm. My first love, my first board that I got to meet, and so I just, it, you know, as the superintendent needs, you know, I, I I need, I'm interviewing you all, too, making sure that this decision was not only going to affect me, but you know, my wife and kids at the time, so. I can remember how little your kids were, Dr. Galavis, like it was yesterday. That's crazy, eh? They were little. They were just little kids. 
I mean, yeah. and they're full grown adults now yeah. in college. Yeah. <laughs> Driving. I mean, I feel like we've helped raise your kids. Well, we have. Oh, they, you they, have. Yeah. They were raised in Kenya, too. And they got good educations here. I hope you're you're yep. happy. Oh, I'm very happy. And did very they, happy. okay, have they had anything at UT that has been Okay, so everybody, we're talent? about to come back if everybody's ready. Oh. oh, I have one more question. Okay. Two more, two more. Okay, we'll go fast. Real okay, quick. Dr. Galvis, your special skill. I think... Um, I can make myself disappear. I agree. <laughs> okay. And what have you enjoyed most about being on this team of eight? I think, what, you know, like you said, it's only been two months, but I just, the last two meetings, you know. Yeah. Okay. It's been both healthy dialogue and healthy debate, so... Okay, have been healthy. I like that. I like healthy lifestyles. Have good one, Dr. Galavis. Okay, you can tell Serge we're ready. I oh, or does ready. he know? Can he hear me? Yeah, he can hear you. Okay, hi, Serge. We're ready. All right, everybody ready? Si, senor. Okay, good. All right, I guess we've finished that part of. Uh, getting a, I guess, a interview, co-interviews of each other. So, Cinto, we're ready. You got it. All right, so here comes the fun part. Who, who'd like to go first? Who'd like to introduce their friend like slash to. colleague? Great, okay. I'd be happy to, because I think that uh, I've got our superintendent to introduce the Honorable Dr. Pedro Galavis. And Dr. Galavis was actually, he was named after his mother's father. So that would be a man that he really, he never knew. But he was named after him, and he saw him in pictures as a child, but he was always an older man. And we know as a child that could mean he, you know, he could have been 30, 40 but he always saw him as an older man. He never saw any youthful pictures. And his grandmother, she was a bit of a feisty one. She really never, ever got warmed up to Pedro's dad. We might wonder why, if any of us have daughters. Uh, and a little unknown fact about Dr. Galavis, everyone called him Perucha as a young child in the family. So that was his beloved name that everyone liked to call him. He was born in Wisconsin in a very cold state. And his parents, he was born to his father, who came from Mexico, who came from Palau, 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 P-A-L-A-U. And his mom came from Camargo. Now, Dr. Galavis's cultural identities are very noteworthy. He's a God-fearing man. That's the first thing in his life. And then after that, he goes right to being a husband, a father, and then he wraps those together. That That's his family. That's next. His family is a unit, and keeping that unit is one. He loves his country, the U.S. of A., and he does happen to be a cheesehead. Born and bred, we're going to just have to let him be that. He is not a cowboy fan. So in school, in his young years, he had the good fortune of a man named Dr. Murphy in Wisconsin, who was an authoritative person at the parochial school, the Catholic school. He convinced Father Heffron, I believe, or maybe Father Heffron convinced Dr. Murphy, I'm not sure how the story went, but that the tuition would be granted for the Galavis children to attend parochial school. And they were a migrant family. Came in and they did cleaning after, I guess after hours at school. So their tuition was granted and they received wonderful, wonderful education from that school. But the 
best standout was Miss Uran, which I think Pedro might have had a little fun with her name as a child. But she was his advocate. She watched out for him at every turn. She knew his brothers and sisters, so, you know, that helped too. Sometimes Pedro got put into the remedial class. And having known the brothers and sisters, she didn't feel that was appropriate. She'd stand up and advocate for him that he needed to be pushed on up. You know, maybe they weren't tapping into the correct teaching method. And he excelled in school. He never did identify with a label. Everyone was kids back then, no type of a label. So when he was looking to become a superintendent, he applied to the Canyoteo School District, mainly because we were an outside, you know, a bedroom community of a city of El Paso. His kids didn't want to grow up like in Fort Stockton, where there wasn't even a Walmart. They wanted to have a little bit of city life when they left Round Rock. So his sister had also been here in the past, and they traveled through El Paso going different places and visited her. So they decided this might be a good place. Well, as Mr. Rodriguez and Miss Mendoza and I'll all remember, they were little bitty kids, and we all met out at the Grove and had a wonderful barbecue dinner. And Dr. Galavis noted that it was like his first prom date. It was his first superintendency. And he was interviewing us very closely as we were interviewing him, checking us to see the good and the bad. Well, his special skill or talent that he's going to bring to this team of eight, and I have to say I think he does a darn good job at it, he does a disappearing act. And we have a new board member, Tristan, you'll have to watch for that one and see if you can pick up on it. And the best thing he enjoyed about this team of eight and being a part of it have been we've had two healthy meetings and he likes a healthy lifestyle and he thinks that's what's going to happen we're going to have a healthy lifestyle on the board so i thank you and with that dr galavis we sure are glad you're with us thank you miss ross you bet i hope everybody got to know him a little better you, you did an excellent job and you set the tone for us so Dr. Galavis, would you like to introduce? Yes, Trustee. sir. I'd like to introduce Miss Laurie Searles. Um, she wasn't named, even though her parents are very special, but her name is Laurie Searles. She wouldn't tell me her middle name, so maybe that could be a, a, um, <laughs> a game we can have with the board during uh, Liza's listening during Board Appreciation Month named Lori Searle's middle name. Her, she was born in Florida on the beach. Um, her parents were from New York. She identifies with God, wife, mother, citizen, being a U.S. citizen, and Hispanic. Her favorite memory in school was she was in, in third grade for two weeks, but she decided she felt as a third grader that, hey, I don't belong in this class or in this grade. So she told, I guess, told the teacher, told the principal, principal called mom, and she met Miss, the fourth grade teacher, Miss Carmen Salcedo, whose brother was a bullfighter. And she just sensed Miss Carmen's happiness and she went on from third grade to fourth grade in two weeks. Um, why does she be, run for the board and why does she continue? Because she said, uh, Miss Patsy would remember this. She came in in 1993, 1993, wrote her name down and left. She didn't campaign because she was asked by teachers, um, community, custodians, staff to run for the board. And I asked her, well, now it's 2021. Why do you still continue to be here? She says, because she's continued to be asked and she's happy to oblige and serve this community. Um, she, what she brings to the board is the history, 
uh, perspective of where Enothea was and and what it's gone, like a Clint Eastwood movie, and I'm adding this, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And she brings it forth with her rationality because this school system is a complex. But so, and what she's about this board is she really wants to get to know the dynamics of each board member and work with each one to serve this community. And so the team of eight, I present Miss Lori Searles from Florida. Good afternoon. Ooh. Very well done. Well done. Uh, who'd like to go next? I'll do it. Okay. Uh, board members, I'd like to introduce uh, Miss Blanca Trout. Um, Blanca is, was born in El Paso. She was uh, born, her name, the meaning of her, her name comes from when she was born. I guess her mom and her family were all thought they were, they were going to have a little baby boy. And she says when she was born, out came a little girl. And everybody was just confused as well, what are we going to do now she says <laughs> her mom related to her <laughs> uh, what are we going to name her and i guess the hospital was had the name or came along with the name of susana and then uh, well, what is, what's her first name going to be well you know she's blanquita she's Guerita, so i guess her name will be blanca susana she was her parents were born in her dad was born in uh, parral her mom was born in El Paso, and although uh, her main cultural identities, her family first, her daughters, that's what she tries to maintain as a strong family, raising her daughters, her family. Her religious beliefs are second, not second, not to minimize it, but she's a very strong religious person, Masonic Jew Jewish. Her third is uh, her ethnicity, Hispanic, being a strong advocate for Hispanic ethnicity. Her language is also a very strong cultural identity for her. She's bilingual, Hispanic. And fifthly, her uh, strong identity is her food. Uh, she says, uh, I guess she identifies as uh, no red meat, no pork, I guess because of her religious uh, experience. Uh, her very strong uh, educational experiences uh, in elementary school when she was introduced to her mu music class. That was her most positive experience. She said she was very, very uh, highly influenced by her music classes that she took. She loves music. You know, she entered, she participates quite a bit with the music uh, elements. She's uh, Number five, why did you choose to run and serve on the board? She's interested, she was started out as being very interested in the education of her daughters, always asking questions, what are you teaching them? How are you educating them? And the more she asked, the more she got involved in trying to ask and participate in her daughter's education. And she figured she might have seen as I'm on the, asking these questions, she wanted to be a mom that be participating and so she ran for the board and got elected. Uh, she advocates for moms being active on the board also. She's very, I know from the public and the people that I've met, they're very high on Blanca and her participation in the issues that surround the school board and the school. Uh, what special skills and talents do you bring? She figures her social skills, her communication skills, I, I know I've seen her out in public and different uh, settings. She's very social. She engages people quite a bit. So that I think is a strong uh, uh, skill. What, what have you enjoyed most about being part of the team of eight? She says, uh, learning from fellow board members. She learns quite a bit. She, I guess she judges, uh, 
not in a detrimental way, but the, the experience of the different board members, she picks up on it and she tries to learn from them, from the other board members. Uh, board, meet Ms. Blanca Trout. Well done, Sal, thank you. Ms. Blanca, would you like to introduce us to this gentleman? Sure, can you hear me? Thank you, Mr. Sal. Dear board, I'm so happy to introduce you my fellow board member, Mr. Salvador Payan. Mr. Salvador Payan, we have a great pleasure to speak and talk. So his full name is Salvador Payan, but he likes to be called Chava. We call him Chava because it's, he identified since he was a kid, everyone call him Chava as a nickname. And I think it's a love name, Chava. So he was born here in El Paso and his parents, they born in Parral, Chihuahua, his dad, and his mom was born in Jalisco, Lagos de Moreno, Jalisco, Jalisciense. Beautiful, beautiful town. So the things that Mr. Salvador Payan, the five cultural identities that he likes, he told me he's very strong and very, very loved to be being a father. It's something that he really appreciates so much to being a father. He had a son and two daughters. And his son graduates from the Air Force. It's, it's something that, that we really need to appreciate that from his son. And the two beautiful daughters. Of course, he grew them up with honor and respect. So Mr. Salvador Payan is also very strong in his fa uh, Catholic faith. He is a person that he's always uh, respect the Catholic faith and try to talk with his family about his Catholic faith and pass on this. So it's something that it means a lot to Mr. Payan. Also, Mr. Payan, he identifies himself a lot with his Hispanic heritage. And he says that it's something very important that we don't need to forget about it. That we don't need to forget the roots, where we came from. It's something that Mr. Salvador Payan, he underlines a lot. So we totally agree with you, Mr. Payan. Also, he enjoyed a lot of agricultural, going and, and, and go with his family, farming and the agricultural. It's something that he really enjoyed it. He likes to do that a lot. And uh, again, uh, family, he has uh, nine members in his family, three sisters and six brothers. So he likes, this, he says he likes to bond with his family, even the brothers and sisters, the marriage scatter all over Dallas, Los Angeles, Las Cruces, but he likes to try to get very tight communication with his family, something that he really loves, Mr. Payan. So it's, 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 it's a good thing, Mr. Payan. And what is his experience? Something very most uh, memory from school, Mr. Payan was telling me that he loves to play football when he was in Canutillo High School. He really enjoyed a lot to play football and he was the second graduate in his class. Mr. Payan, we know something good about you now. It's beautiful, Mr. Payan. Um, Mr. Payan also shared with me why he wanted to run for this board. He says that he would like to contribute with the community. He would like to, to, to over, oversee and try to put a balance in, in the taxes. He told me something about the taxes that he was so concerned because it was a lot of tax paying here in this community. That is something that that's the reason, one of the reasons that he ran for a board. And of course that to be sure to provide what the kids needs for education and succeed in their lives. So also the last thing is what have enjoyed the most, Mr. Uh, Mr. Payan, to be an experience of a team of eight. He says that, of course, uh, Mr. Payan, he enjoyed a lot to, um, this is practice a career. Oh, the good skills that he learned when he was in his political career, he wanted to bring it to the board. He wanted to bring the communication skills, advocator, and that maturity to put that balance in this board. 
the the uh, ex the expertise that he has in 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 the in the communications with uh, with the public, the expertise that he has in the political career. So that's that's the balance that he wanted to bring to the board, and he enjoyed it to be in this board. Thank you, Mr. Payan. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is my colleague board member, Mr. Salvador Payan. Wonderful, wonderful. Good job, my friends. We are halfway there. Um, who'd like to go next? Thank you, Blanca. You're welcome, Mr. Payan. Um, I'll go next. Or, go ahead. Um, I interviewed Mr. Sergio Coronado. Mr. Coronado uh, was named by his mother, Sergio, not because it was after anybody, but because she liked the name. But she had a nickname for him by the name of Arturo. And when, when she was trying to discipline that Arturo usually came out for Mr. Coronado by his mother. So if, if, if no one else called him Arturo but his mom. Uh, Mr. Coronado was born in El Paso at Hotel Du, uh, a, a hospital that no longer exists. But uh, in El Paso ISD has taken over the, the facility where that hospital was located. Mr. Coronado's parents come from Mexico, uh, from the area of Chihuahua. Um, his dad was born in Concha Estacion, about two hours from Chihuahua, and his mom was born in the area of Delicia, which was about 10 or 15 minutes from uh, Concha Estacion. Mr. Coronado, uh, his cultural identity was he lived with his grandmother, uh, early in life, and so Mr. Coronado's first language was Spanish. Um, he also relates, as far as cultural, with his community, uh, legal community, being a lawyer and, and knowing the system and, and having those type of relationships, I think have um, formed Mr. Coronado into the lawyer that he is today. Um, one thing that I don't think people would know about Mr. Coronado is that he's a camper. He loves to camp. He and his son have gone camping and he's instilled in his son the love of camping so much so that his son is, is going to go camping uh, by himself, uh, which Mr. Coronado worries about, but uh, his son is going camping by himself to celebrate his birthday, which I think is, is wonderful. Uh, one thing that I think uh, most of us on the board know that Mr. Coronado has a wonderful sense of humor. He is funny. Uh, he usually breaks the ice when there's tension and he'll usually come up with something uh, uh, funny that we could laugh about and go on. Um, Mr. Coronado, of course, was born, was raised in Canutillo since the third grade, and his educational uh, life-changing experience was when he went to UT Austin Law School. Uh, he learned that he was good enough to be there. He learned that he could compete and outperform a lot of the students there. One of the things that's most memorable to Mr. Coronado was he had uh, a law professor uh, that would vocalize that um, he felt that the Hispanic law students were merely taking up space uh, in, in, in the classroom. And that really resonated with uh, Mr. Coronado and it made him achieve his goals. Um, he came to Canutillo schools in the third grade. And when he was in high school, he and a friend of his 
uh, decided that they would uh, run for the school board right upon graduating. Well, Mr. Coronado's um, life, uh, as it does for all of us, uh, changed. And 30 years later, Mr. Coronado signed up to run for the school board. He feels like he ran for the board because he wanted to make a difference. He felt that um, the kids from Carutillo were looked down upon and were not treated with the respect by community and by uh, 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 the other surrounding communities. Um, Mr. Coronado's talent, and I have to agree with him, is that he feels he's good at, at planning. He has a broad perspective, and and uh, I think Mr. Coronado, and I'm adding this, Mr. Coronado's communication skills are excellent. Um, he has served on this board for 15 years, and he said he's, he's also seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. I added that. Um, he says that there were times when he didn't want to go to the meeting because of, of uh, the nature in which the meetings were conducted and the, the, the discussion and debate about uh, the different things that the board members were passionate about. He feels like um, the best thing for the board um, that he's enjoyed about being part of this team of eight is that we can agree to disagree um, with the other trustees that, that we're not all going to be of the same opinion, of the same uh, likes, but that we can walk away and, and respect that other board member's opinion and say, OK, uh, we might have not voted for that, but the board voted for that. So we are, are one in the decision of the board. Um, I think Mr. Coronado remembers the days of when we were serving on the board that the board members would actually um, have, uh, uh, you know, camaraderie not only in the board meetings, but would also socialize with their spouses and families. And, and it was more of a feeling of a family. Uh, I'd like to introduce Mr. Sergio Coronado to you all. Thank you, Ms. Patsy. Appreciate the introduction. I would, uh, board, fellow board members, I'd like to introduce one of our newest, but not new board member uh, this time, Ms. Patricia Sapien Mendoza. Uh, you're looking great, Patsy, by the way. That flower on your neck is just <laughs> perfect for inauguration day. <laughs> Well, Patsy was born in the thriving metropolis of Anthony, Texas, okay? And I say Texas because Anthony, Texas is smaller, I think, probably than the side of New Mexico. I don't know. It used to be probably about even now. But it probably was back in those days, Patsy, a lot, lot smaller than Canutillo, I think, no? So, um, yeah, that's, that's where... Pat, that's a new one on me. I thought Patsy all along had been born in Canutillo. <laughs> but her parents were also uh, born, both of them born in Canutillo, and actually they were neighbors. Patsy tells us that uh, her main, that, that her name had no real meaning as, it was, as how she was uh, named, but that uh, she was the oldest of three girls, so she broke the ice. And I guess an interesting fact is that her her mom and dad were neighbors and all that separated them as neighbors was the alley. And I added that that's where they met in the alley. <laughs> but um, 
Patsy, apart from being a uh, board member, has also served the Canutillo district for many, many moons and probably the nicest employee anybody's ever seen here in Canutillo. And her cultural identities is, uh, is as a mother, a grandmother and a granddaughter, right? And so that was a uh, bit special to her. And one thing that she really pointed out that, that, that really uh, gave her solace and calm is that she was able to take care of her mom till she passed away. Um, and that that was doing that for her was very rewarding to her. One other thing that her and her husband love to do, she says, is they love to go to casinos and win tons of money that they're going to share with the board. <laughs> I added the last part. <laughs> so I'm thinking of you, board. But and, uh, one thing that she tells me about her educational experience and that probably a lot of us growing up in Canutillo remember is that um, you know, she, most of our classes back then were very small, and Patsy's was no exception. She had a, she was came from a very small graduating class, and that, uh, and that the teachers back then would tell the parents, their parents, not to expect anything of excellence from the students, from their sons and daughters. You know, and that uh, that their high school counselor would bring applications instead of to college and trade schools, to the manufacturing plants locally so that they could apply. That was the counseling that unfortunately uh, existed. So she ran for the board. Um, she tells us for her mother and father that it was, you know, um, that it was really a sacrifice. She would see her parents that it was really a sacrifice for them to scrounge up the money to pay their taxes, but they did it dutifully. And so she said that when she decided to run for the board, that she wanted to make sure that that their that her parents' tax money was being spent wisely on the students, the kids. So you know, I've heard a lot of board mem a, a lot of other board members that say you know, I ran because I want my tax dollar, my tax dollars to be spent. But Patsy wasn't worried about her. She was worried about her parents because she saw that the sacrifice they had to do to do it. So another one of her traits that comes out, self, selfless. So her special skill or talent, she says she loves cohesiveness of a group. And she thinks that the right attitude should uh, be able to move a school and a school district forward. And that she's seen how a dysfunctional board can filter down to everybody and that it affects everybody. And it keeps uh, you know, the district and the organization from, from producing the best for the students. And she says that the, what she's enjoyed most is uh, about uh, being a, on the team of eight is a critical time in the district when back in 2011, when the state cut funding to the schools and we had to fire 40 some teachers. And it was Patsy and three other board members, four board members that had to vote to fire these 45 teachers. I uh, myself was one of them, as well as Armando and Monica Casares. And the very next day, she showed up along with the other board members to this to the boardroom where the teachers were called in to give them the the bad news. And all those four board members were here present to, to tell them that, that, that it wasn't something that they necessarily, you know, felt good about or any, anything good, really good about, but that they, you know, that she did tell them that we were gonna work hard for them to make sure that we passed that tax rollback 
so that we could rehire them. And lo and behold, that came to fruition in the district, the community voted and passed the tax rollback. And so she said that that was one of her, you know, things that she enjoyed the most is having to welcome these teachers back when they were rehired. So board, I introduce you as Patricia Sapien Mendoza. Thank you, Patsy. Very well done, very well done. And we are down to the final two board members. Well, I'll go uh, before. Let me first reintroduce, since we've <laughs> we uh, interviewed a couple months ago, Mr. Tristan Angel Hernandez. And um, so Tristan actually gets his middle name from his dad and his twin brother, Demetrius, gets his dad's middle name, Renee. And uh, pretty much he said there wasn't much uh, meaning in the family, but that the mom used to read about King Arthur and that's probably where she got that name uh, because nobody else has it in the family. So um, he was born in El Paso at Las Palmas. Um, and both his parents were born in El Paso. His dad attended Coronado High School and his mom attended Canotillo. Um, the five top cultural identities uh, is Hispanic, uh, Mexican. He's a son and a brother, uh, but he has an old soul, right? He doesn't, does not jump on trends and he also has a kind soul. Um, educational experience, right? Um, and what impact it had. So he graduated Canotillo High School in 2018. Uh, from there, he went to UTEP uh, and took a break and learned uh, at, he took an internship at Walt Disney where he learned about some professional development courses, some engineering courses um, and an aura of excellence, right? Building character. So he was able to learn a lot uh, within that internship. And then he came back and he still is a UTEP student. Um, so picks up. And then um, the reason he chose to serve on the board uh, was to give back to the community that helped raise him. And so uh, he, he's here to give back and his special skills, uh, talents, or strengths that he brings to our team of eight um, is his youth, right? Um, it took me uh, out of the being the youngest board member, but uh, we welcome him as uh, his youth is a good perspective to get. Uh, it's a new perspective and his op. Uh, his, my tongue tight, optimism. <clears throat> and so uh, those are some of the skills and talents that he brings. Um, what has he enjoyed most about being on the team of eight is of course meeting new people, which is us, the board uh, and uh, some staff, um, but his, his, um, his learning has, you know, his added value of his capacity personally and professionally has grown um, just being on the board a couple months and also attaining, uh, attending some of the, the TASB training that was uh, provided last week. And board, please meet um, Mr. Tristan Angel Hernandez. So, up there, Armando. Tristan, you get to tell us about Armando. Alrighty, so alrighty, so um, Armando Isaac Rodriguez. Um, Mondo said that he got his his middle name Armando from his uncle on his dad's side, Manny, and his middle name from his mom's side uncle, right? Isaac. Yeah. Yeah, his mom's side uncle was Isaac. Middle name. Um, Mondo was born in El Paso, Texas. Um, mother was born in El Paso and dad was born in Puerto Rico. 
Um, and the five things or a couple things, you know, that Mondo would, would um, describe himself as is a Latino, Hispanic, you know, Latin X with, with no ties to discriminate being that he is from Mexican and Puerto Rican um, descent, you know, um, Himondo says that he is a border kid, which I think all of us that grew up here in El Paso can, <laughs> can you know, agree with, um, that he's a public servant, a uh, man of faith, and, and I, think, I think most importantly, a good son, you know, taking care of his mom um, right now. And I think that's one of the best things we could do, you know. Um, Mondo grew up in, Mondo graduated high school in 2002 from Canotillo. Um, and his UTEP degree is from international business. Fun fact I didn't know, Armando started in political science, but being that he was already like in the political landscape, he decided to switch. And um, that's how come the international business uh, degree came about. Um, when Mondo ran, he wanted to have a connection to the most recent graduation, the most recent graduating students, um, being that he was young at the time as well. Um, you know, and improve, and so that way he can improve the student capacity and the trajectory through many of the youth in our community, you know. And I do hate to break it to you, Mondo, but the young blood has come back now. And that's gonna be my job, you know, to um, to try and connect to the most the most recent students and the most recent graduates, you know. Um, <laughs> um, so some special skills that uh, he would say were, um, would be his youth. Um, and now his ability to, to bring knowledge on educational policy and his ability to connect and, and, and network, you know, and, and bring those connections and the stuff he learns from the, from the networking and the people he meets um, back to the board. Um, and, and so we can use the knowledge through his outside thinking and, and innovative thoughts that he can come back with. Um, and not only that, but to bring equity to the school, you know, to the school district and, and have people come and realize, hey, um, Canotillo's growing, we're going to continue growing and we want to achieve excellence, you know. Um, um, and one thing that Mondo thought was that being on this team of eight um, that he really enjoys was that um, we're being more cohesive and, and centering the discussion more towards um, students and, and kind of diverting away from, from non-student related uh, items. And yeah, that's Armando Rodriguez. Armando Isaac Rodriguez. <laughs> All right. Well done, Canotillo. Well done. Uh, what, I'm going to ask for a one word check in on how you're feeling. How are you feeling right now? We're about an hour and a half in on Team of Eight. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll call as I see you on my screen. Trusty Trout, what's a one word? How are you feeling right now? I feel so happy, but more happy because I just got the opportunity to know more my fellow trustee, Mr. Payan, and so happy to know a little bit more about each one of them. Thank you. Uh, President Coronado. You're I guess I can ditto that. Um, yeah, it makes me warm to hear some of the um, I guess facts about the upbringing about my fellow board members. A lot of them I've known for a long time and it's good to, you know, find, find out something different that is really uh, positive and heartwarming. Thank you, sir. Um, Trustee Payan, or should I say Chava? Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that um, I, I've known Sergio, Patsy, Mando, I think all my life, <laughs> I would say, because I saw him growing up in Canutillo. And the feeling I get, it's, it's uh, I guess, confidence and um, optimistic about the future of Canutillo. I know since I've known Mando and Sergio and Patsy, Patsy, I know her family intimately, they're very good friends. And her dad and mom were my older brothers and sisters' friends, went to school at El Paso High. But my, my feeling right now is optimism, confidence in the future of the school district because, you know, being on here, and I've heard it numerous times, I grew up 
in the political battles of the school district back then when inequity was rampant. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll say it out loud. They, it was just not equitable when they were back there. And, uh, and there's been a lot of people ahead of us. Ralph Reyes, Avelino Lopez, Elias Hernandez, Silvestre Reyes, Ron, uh, a lot of those people that worked tremendously hard for the advocate and to try to better the school district. And Sergio and Mando and Patsy and Ms. Trout, Ms. Searles, she knows those battles that we fought. So I'm very optimistic about the future and who I'm serving with. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Mendoza, one word, how are you feeling? Hopeful. Uh, on such a, a wonderful day as the inauguration of our next president, uh, of President Biden, I feel hopeful that our team of eight is going to achieve wonderful things because we look at each other as family. Thank you. Trustee Searles. I think it says what we all know. We love this school district. We love our students. We love our community. And it just overpours. So the one word's going to be the love. All right. Thank you. Dr. Galaviz, what's one word? How are you feeling right now? I, you know, I think it, 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 the why. Because in order to have dialogue, you need to uh, have have a common meaning and a common understanding in order to go forward. And that everybody has that why, everybody has a beginning, everybody has a history, everybody has those experiences, those experiences that have shaped them until for, for this day and for this service that we're about to do for this community. And it also makes you vulnerable, so. Thank you, sir. Uh, Trustee Rodriguez. The one word is family, but our ability to grow as a family, I think uh, the start and hopefully the future is bright, so. Thank you. Trustee Hernandez. Um, well, I think the one word I have to use is, is connected. Um, being that I, I am um, new, I don't really know everyone to the depth that they know each other, you know? Um, and I, I feel connected because um, to learn these stories, to learn um, intimate parts of their life about their history. Um, and, it, and it honestly makes me feel inspired, you know, to, to know who I'm working with and know that we all do have um, a common love for this community that we can all agree on. And even if we don't agree on, on certain opinions or certain whatever, that we can get through this, through our, our love for Canotillo and our love for the community. Trustee Hernandez, so young and so wise. And so, uh, you know, you've, you've just set the tone for what we're about to take a deep dive into, uh, even the not agreeing, right? Uh, we, 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 wanna, uh, we wanted to be able to come and, and create what we call a brave space, a braver space. Uh, we we want to be able to leave you with some tools um, uh, uh, here for Cano TYST. Um, but the reason I waited for the one word check-in is I wanted to to see if if we could use if I'm gonna, I'm going to use your word, uh, Tristan, is to see if we could connect. And and this comes from a mindset uh, from a book called Leadership and Self Deception. Uh, the mindset of uh, do I see my colleagues as people to be invested in? people that I will care for as human beings, um, or will I see them as objects to be moved? Uh, the research on school board governance is riddled with the dysfunction of boards and uh, you know, it's really good to see positive atmosphere in Gano Tio, uh, the, the, the feeling of connectedness, the feeling I hear it family, I'm here in love, um, so that you can be focused on student outcomes and get the work done. Um, but that's the question. Do you see each other as people to be invested in or do you see each other as objects to be moved? And we've got to conduct business as board members. So what happens in those tough times? What happens when we have conflict? And uh, what we're going to propose from Leadership by Z's perspective is going to be um, to transition from this, you know, there are boards who believe that they believe in artificial harmony. Uh, there are boards that around the state and around the country who say we ought to have uh, seven O votes. Uh, and we think that that shows that we're a great board. Uh, I would beg to differ. Uh, that artificial harmony 
can be muzzling and can be hindering and can be um, silencing people. And each of you as trustees represent Canotillo community and school district. If you are not voting the way, based on your values and, and your perspective, uh, and you're doing it just for the artificial harmony, then um, I'd, I'd, I'd submit to you that um, you're probably doing yourself a disservice. And so what does a 4-3 vote look like? Um, does it have to be, you know, to where it's, it's high levels of conflict? Like, oh, I'm gonna get you back. Um, uh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find a way to hurt you. Um, you know, it is definitely possible to get four or three votes and everyone not be angry with one another. How do we create that brave space for that to happen is part of what we're going to unpack here uh, as, uh, for, for the workshop. I want to take a pause and invite my colleague, Patricia. We're, what's coming up for you, my friend, as you listen to our friends at Canotillo and the transition that we're about to have with uh, the braver space. Yeah, I, uh, first of all, appreciate um, having the opportunity to hear about each of you and to get better acquainted. And I think, you know, what I hear um, an echo from the connectivity is, is the, the heart can build a bridge, right? The, the mind sometimes can divide us, but the heart can build a bridge. So if we have a foundation, um, a foundation in f family, a foundation in an understanding of who we are and where we want to go, um, then that, that is a foundation you can build from. So I'm excited to, to move through the, the, the tools. Thank you. How about you, Cinto? What are you feeling? Um, I'm, I always feel connected here at Canotillo. This, this town is, is very good to me. <laughs> so I keep coming back. Um, so here we go, my friends. Thank you, PA. We are going to take a dive into understanding what is the difference between a brave space and a safe space. Um, safe space, th this is actually based on a scholarly piece uh, by Adal and Clemens. Uh, and so I'll, I'm gonna walk through with you real quick with what they are um, so that we can make a decision. Do we wanna create a brave space in Canotillo? Uh, a, a space where we uh, are unapologetic about fighting for the best possible student outcomes. So the safe space, as you'll note, is, is, is this is really designed to have people feeling comfortable uh, and safety is a priority in the dialogue and they wanna minimize conflict. Um, that, there are definitely places for safe spaces and there are times in your boardroom you might wanna have safe spaces. Uh, but if you're gonna have unapologetic approach at advocating for the best possible student outcomes, I would suggest that you take a good look at what a brave space would do. Brave space is gonna welcome conflict. Uh, and it depends on how you view conflict. So we're gonna go through that here in a bit as well. But it, it encourages a cross-cultural dialogue. That way other perspectives and other voices are heard. Um, the, the feeling of vulnerability, Dr. Galavis just said it, vulnerability. You know, you may feel exposed, you may feel vulnerable. Um, the other thing is with the brave space is that you're constantly challenging your own mental model, how you perceive the world. I think that the reopening of schools, the conversation that's happening statewide, nationwide, and around the world, I'll stick for what's true for us in Texas. The conversation of opening schools has taken so many different perspectives. And if trustees don't have a brave space um, and, and, and aren't able to speak their truth uh, and their perspective, uh, then, then again, I'm, I'm going to say that the community is missing out. Uh, the team is missing out. So what brave spaces look like is these terms. We are used to hearing agree to disagree. What brave spaces suggest is controversy with civility. And what this means is um, when you're gonna have different perspectives in a boardroom, different human beings with different um, values, possibly, um, conflict is gonna naturally happen. And if, if you really are beginning to value everyone's perspectives, um, you can have controversy with civility, meaning that I'm not going to go for the jugular, I'm not trying to hurt you personally, politically. Uh, we'll go into that again in a little bit more detail. But what we would propose is instead of saying agree to disagree, is why not lean into the, by calling it controversy with civility. Um, Going to go to the next one that's also part of a brave space is owning your intentions and your impact. Um, I know that I have as the president of my board, I have done and said things historically 
that have upset some of my colleagues. Um, here's, here's how I address it now. I'll say I'll own the impact, but the intention is not, was not, the intention was not to hurt you or to upset you. I will own that how I worded it and how I did it had a negative effect on you. So I'm not apologizing for, for, for my intention. I am apologizing for the impact that it had on my colleagues, because that's not something I want to do for them. So as you know here, this is saying own your intentions and your impact versus saying no judgment. I mean, judgments are happening 24 <laughs> seven. So can, can, we, can we introduce the idea of owning that? Another one is people say challenge by choice, but we're gonna say challenge and awareness that you lean into the activities that we're gonna do, um, that you get in touch with your feelings about if it's making you uncomfortable, uh, I'll challenge you to say, ask yourself, why am I getting uncomfortable with this topic? What is it about this that's making me uncomfortable? Um, so that you lean into it and you can tap into what's coming up for you. And the last one is respect and differentiate. So in other words, a lot of folks, we're gonna do some agreements in a minute. A lot of folks say, I wanna feel respected in the boardroom. We'll notice that respect may look different for different people. Um, so respect and differentiate versus using the no attacks. This is saying that if Tristan, you're the new board member here at Gunnathiel, I don't like what you're saying about that one topic and that agenda item. I'm going to challenge the topic. I'm not going to challenge you as a person, as a human being. I'm gonna attack the idea. I'm not gonna attack you, the person, right? It, and it is possible to have controversy with civility, but it means that you all would be able to differentiate and say that to one another, like, uh, uh, sorry, Trustee uh, Mendoza, I'm going to challenge the idea. I'm not challenging you. I'm challenging the idea that's on the table. And this is my perspective and this is how I see it. So how do we get there and how do we do this? It, it begins with finding common ground and um, being able to bridge the gaps is the work that we want to be able to do. So I'm going to give you an example of how we've done it in Fort Worth. Um, you'll see on the screen and um, Trustee Searles, hopefully you've got this packet where it's the agreements that says up there with Fort Worth ISD. Um, I do. Okay, good. You'll notice there, these are agreements that we as a board came up with. And there was a whole bunch of others that we put up on the board or on the screen that did not make the list. Uh, so I'm gonna tell you the purpose of this. Um, I'm, I'm here in your boardroom and I'm, and I'm looking around and I see the vision and the mission. Um, and I would ask, do, do any of you off the top of your head know the values um, or, or the, the core values of your district? It's okay if you don't, because I don't know mine either in Fort Worth. What I do know are these agreements that we, that we came up with as a board, because we invested time, energy, and we had a lot of dialogue and we even had some debate. And we differentiated, right? We're, we, we, need, we need to go back to dialogue. We need to go back to dialogue because this debate isn't helping any of us. But what we needed to be able to create a brave space was to create some agreements because rules were meant to be broken. Agreements are a living document that you own, that we own in Fort Worth. So when I, I have violated these agreements recently, and I, one of my colleagues reached out to me and said, you violated this agreement here. This is how I feel about it. And I had to own it. Like I'm the president of the board and I'm supposed to model the highest level of integrity. And I did not mean to violate that agreement, uh, but it was a really, really good conversation. So if you all, when you have conflict, you can revert back to your agreements to say, uh, we made an agreement here as a board, as a team of eight. And so what you'll notice here is my superintendent in Fort Worth, he started us off by saying, conflict is the DNA of leadership. If any leader who can't lean into conflict uh, may not be able to get a lot accomplished because conflict means that you're willing to be in that discomfort to challenge your ideas and challenge other ideas. You'll see also um, here when you, you heard me say listening from zero, uh, we, we said that we wanna hear one another. We don't wanna, we, and, and I'm gonna tell you, I walked into a board that was very volatile in 2013. Uh, so this this exists because we had that that toxicity in our in our boardroom, and what I'm saying is, if your boardroom is operating great, this is kind of one of those prevention measures 
so that when the conflict comes that you don't go down that road and don't allow those kinds of days to come into Ganotillo. But the listening from zero is really important to us. Uh, you'll notice the I statements. Um, these are because in the past, some of my colleagues would say, well, we as a board are thinking this, or, you know, we've already, I remember one time, one of them said, it's already been decided. We decided. And I said, wait, hold on. I'm a board member. I'm new. Who, who decided that? Walking quorum? Probably. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, why don't we just speak for what's true for you versus you trying to speak for me? Because you're not me. So the I statements for us are very, very important so that I can say, this is my personal feelings. These are my I statements. This, this is how I see the situation versus trying to say, oh, the, you know, as a, as representing all the young board members here, uh, this is how we feel about it. That's dangerous territory. So you'll notice the I statements that we have are rooted in that. Um, I act on facts rather than assumptions. We had a lot of conflict in our boardroom because there was a lot of assumptions being made between board members. And what happens when assumptions like that run rampant? Um, there's some pretty negative effects that can come out of it. Uh, a lot of backstabbing and a lot of uh, inappropriate behavior. And so what I would submit to you is the idea of creating some agreements of what you need in order for you to be able to create a brave space. And um, we'll go through those in a minute, but I want to get through this piece because I, I think it puts it all together for us. Conflict, I'm gonna give you some examples of how to look at this uh, in your boardroom. And Tristan, I know you're new, so think about conflict in, in other arenas of your life. Uh, so what does conflict look like for you? Um, it's important to note that even just one board member can throw off an entire team of eight. One board, let me say it again, one board member can throw off an entire team of eight. And so being mindful that our behaviors run parallel to the student outcomes and to our systems is part of the part of the dialogue that we're going to be having. So how do you view conflict? Some board members that I've interacted with statewide, nationwide, they look at conflict like a battlefield. Um, there's going to be a winner and a loser and there's going to be bloodshed. I'm going to hurt you uh, politically or personally. Uh, that's I would say that is a dangerous mindset to have on a team of eight, but I just want you to be mindful of, of what's coming up for you. I'm, I'm guilty of all of these myself, by the way. I am not perfect. Um, I have gone through my, my redemption tour in my own boardroom because I've been in battlefield mode in, in my own boardroom. Some people look at conflict like a competition. I like conflict. Um, I, I don't mind it, I'm not, but I'm not, going for, I'm not looking for blood here. Uh, in here, I just wanna see if I can win. I put this agenda item on there and I want to see if I can get the votes. It's going to be fun for me to see if I can get it to pass. Uh, but if I lose it, I'm not going to be upset and I'm not going to create all this, all this havoc within the boardroom. And there are people that like, comp that like conflict and they look at it like competition. And then there are board members who look at conflict like a garden. And looking at it like a garden means, have I invested enough in each one of you of my, of my colleagues and the superintendent that when we have conflict, I go for a branch, but I don't go for the roots. Because when conflict is gonna happen, have I invested enough in you and you invested enough in me that we know that we're not going to despise one another, that we're not gonna have this animosity towards one another. Uh, people that look at conflict like a garden uh, are people that are able to lean into it and get a lot of things done uh, and usually can be bridge builders and coalition builders. The final one that's not on here is people, there are people that don't like conflict at all. They shy away from it, they shut down, uh, they, they go into their shell. And so what I would ask is based on the, the governance models from TEA is the two questions that we usually ask is what are, the, what are the pros, what are the cons? In other words, what are the benefits and what are the costs? So I'm gonna take a pause and go back to these and see what's coming up for you in Canotillo, um, and which one do you think you you might be more more um, more willing to to do when you lean in into conflict? And Patricia, I'll look for you to help as well. I I would think that we would look at it at conflict as a garden. That I think that's the best way to go. 
we take out a branch, like you said, and not not the whole plant. Thank you, Trustee Mendoza. Who else? So I'll go next. And in regards to, I see this battlefield competition garden, right? And I've probably been in each one of those. <laughs> and I, I think the most important one is how do we grow, uh, which is that garden, right? How do we uh, really, we have some healing as a board that I think is going in the right direction. And we still have a lot of growth as how we could really make this district excel and be uh, a leader, not just in Texas, but in the country. Um, Trustee Rodriguez, what, what have been what have been some of the costs and some of the benefits for, give us an example of when you've been in, say, Battlefield? Uh, <laughs> there's, there's some wounds that we still need to heal, but I, I think the, the Battlefield was <laughs> At the movement of a, of, of a barn in the district. And I'm hoping that we could heal and grow. You, so tell me the benefits and the cost of when you're in battlefield. Um, I, I don't think there was a win-win situation. I think uh, our community was hurt. I think uh, our district was hurt. I, I, I I don't think battlefield's a way to go, but sometimes that's the option that's taken, you know, so. Okay. And I, I, I think um, I, I'd like to also offer, you know, when we talk about this and we go back to the agreements and we think about that there's process procedures and policy, right? All of that is board work, but if we don't lay the groundwork, which is the process and the agreements um, and how you, manage conflict on your board. So I would ask you another question. How do you view resolution on your board? There are many types of resolution and sometimes each of these forms of conflict management can get you to a different resolution. So uh, Trustee Rodriguez, when you are talking about wounds that need to be healed, is the resolution to that battlefield mentality that those, that those wounds are healed through uh, further dialogue are those, how do you view a resolution around that battlefield mentality? Are you all picking on me? No, just, I think it's important. <laughs> I, I think in regards to uh, how do we get the resolve? I think it, it's, this is what we're looking at as building capacity, right? Um, within our board, within our board members and how do we put the systems and structures in place so that way it is systemically there. And the perfect example is this, we're hoping that with your all's coaching throughout a year, we could address the issue and grow as an organization. I think many times school districts will have a team of eight building right after an election and then a hot topic comes in and it just, they're in battlefield. And how do we get back to growing and healing? And, and that's through mentorship and guidance and putting, we'll have to address policy, right? Because it's important as policymakers that we address it to address it systemically. But I think over the first year in the conversation we've been having with our colleagues is having this type of uh, training where we could have because we need a heal, but we got some brave, we need to make some brave spaces to really have some conversation on how we could excel this district like no other. And I think it, there's no better way of doing it than addressing it through, through professional development, through having those frank conversations. And I think sometimes we need to have a powwow and really hopefully move forward. But I think it's important for a, a district or any district to make sure that it's not just one training. It's a continuous over a year or maybe even longer, right? What's the next uh, after 
uh, leadership ISD, what other ways can we grow as the as the district? As we know, our district has excelled tremendously, even within the infighting. And so I think for me is that healing and that growing. Does that answer that? Patricia? Yeah, thank you. I think, uh, and I appreciate it. We're not trying to pick on you, but uh, I think, uh, I, th I think it just warrants conversation that there are different types of resolution, right? Just like there are different types to, to deal with conflict. You know, a resolution could just mean a vote, right? But also a resolution can be transformative. A resolution can be about healing and hearing each other and creating a space where that is safe and that is braver. Um, and so that's an important part of, a, of the resolution process as well. And so that's just something that I wanted to, you know, as I was hearing you talk about the battlefield, it sounded like resolution for you in that space is about healing. There'll be other times where the board will have conversations and we'll, we'll manage conflict and the resolution will be a vote, right? So there's so many different ways. And that's the, those are the layers that create really great board work. So thanks for sharing. Um, so actually, can I piggyback off um, what you guys have all have said, um, and and keeping in, in in keeping in the comparison of the battlefield competition and and garden, um, a lot of times I, I think that especially with us the when in each way right the battlefield is often looked in like oh casualties you know what's what's going on at each side, but there's also collateral that happens. And when, when we're in the battlefield mode, I, I can't speak personally because I haven't been in, in any quite situations, you know, but, but generally speaking, um, the collateral would be the students, you know, and, and we may not feel it, right, but they will feel the effects of, of our, 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 the battlefield mentality we have going on, right, and, and to move it to competition as well, um, I'm, I'm all for competition, you know, opposing ideas, as long as you keep it professional and, 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 and open-minded, right? But when we start using the students again as, as the pieces for the competition, I, I don't agree. And I think that we should be doing everything in benefit of them, right? And then in the garden as well, the branches, and we can't pull out, we can't uproot all the good that has happened, like you guys said, right? Um, because then again, who does it affect the, the students, you know, essentially who we're here serving. Um, so I, I don't think it's just between all of us. Um, I think that there's collateral in that the students also feel the effects of what we're, um, um, I guess what we're manifesting when we're, when we're debating each other. Mm -hmm. Well done, Tristan. And, and again, man, I think you're always giving me that chance to to, to pivot right to where we're going to be heading, right? That if, if, I, if, if, if I'm I could, in battle, or let me go ahead, Sal. If I could make a comment, you know, and, and along the same thought that Tristan was bringing up, when the board is in a battlefield mode, okay? And I, I agree with Tristan wholeheartedly, but it also, part of that collateral damage or collateral effect affects the teachers because they then start taking sides on who's who and who's not and who's right and who's not. And more importantly, it affects the community, the taxpayer, because in the battlefield mode, everybody's taking sides and everybody's trying to gin up negativity about one side or the other. And that's where the community then, or the taxpayer come up there. You know, the side effects also impact the community in, in a matter of the taxes that they pay. They feel it's not, that's not what we paid for. That's not what we're investing for. We're investing in our kids. And when parents or the community start taking sides, they lose sight of what it is that we are in it for, the kids the education of the kids. Can I say something, Cinto? Please. Um, you know, 
one of the things that I think we as board members need to ask ourselves first when we're thinking about whether it's we're taking a battlefield approach, competitive approach or garden approaches, for example, in a battlefield, is it, am I doing it for something that I think is beneficial to me and I'm not gonna back down? Or is it because I wanna hurt somebody else's position? And just, it's a battlefield, we're doing it against that person or that block, just because. On the competition side, is it, am I really bringing forth something that I know is a winning idea for the district and the kids? Or is it because I just wanted to compete with the other side? And there's variations of that. And on the garden side is, am I doing it really in an, in an effort to do that or or am I, instead of plucking a, a leaf or a branch from something, am I throwing weeds in there to compete in that specter with the plants? I'm not gonna do that, but I'm gonna throw these things in there. So you have to look at the perspective and the questioning on yourself of why is it that I'm bringing forward this argument and is it going to be perceived by somebody as that I'm at war? That I'm, you know, competing um, unfairly? Or am I really competing fairly and I want true competition of ideas to float out there and I'm good with whatever happens? So it, 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 it's also a perspective. And other board members may look at it and say, and feel that you're acting in battlefield mode when, we, when you may be in competition mode. So I guess it's important that how you deliver your idea, your proposal, your counterpoint, is that you make it known that it's not your intention to be at war or just to compete for the sake of destroying something, some other idea or somebody's idea, but really truly say, yeah, I'm proposing this because I think it's beneficial. So to, to to transition and the importance of why in Fort Worth we had to come to agreements. We had to find agreements so that we could keep humanity at the center of the room, keep students at the center of the room and to create those parameters for ourselves just on how we conduct business on a day to day. Um, I, I, I've, I got a model for you just a little bit that and, um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna try to lead by example in the vulnerability when I was in battlefield mode and the number of times in my own boardroom, I, I, I caused so much damage between myself and my colleagues that some of it was never really fully repaired. Uh, we've had major turnover in our boardroom, which presented a new opportunity for me to be more of a gardener perspective. And especially as a president, then I have, I have a responsibility in my district to create that, that brave space where I'm constantly monitoring um, the level of, um, of, of respect with one another, because I have to model that. And so the agreements is what helps us get there. The, the creating a dialogue versus a debate, uh, part of the agreements. And, and so one of the things that you saw in the full with ISD agreements is we have a number seven, and that comes from a mentor of mine named Ricky Clark. He used to work, he works with young people in the community. And he, he said, number seven is respect. And so in full with ISD, when a board member feels disrespected, they now have the opportunity to raise their hand and say number seven, which does a couple of things. Everyone in the room is supposed to stop and listen to that person, hear why they were offended or triggered, and we create that space. Now it's different in open session versus an executive session. Usually the number sevens come out in executive session, uh, but at least now what we do is we take a pause to say somebody's feeling offended or hurt. Let's not let this fester. 
let's not let this build up because if, if that person internalizes it, if you, you're familiar with any of the counseling sessions, when you internalize, the stuff's gonna come out somehow, some way. So what we are about is trying to stay on top of our team dynamics so that we don't, we don't have to deal with those kinds of consequences later. And to, to your points, if, if, I'm, if I'm in battlefield mode and I'm causing damage between myself and my colleagues, the way it's impacting, as you said, Sal and Tristan, it is impacting the entire system because we're being watched, uh, you know, and, and how, we, how we conduct ourselves and how we treat one another. Um, we would expect what we call parallel processing and governance that if I'm being disrespectful to one of my colleagues or the superintendent, then I shouldn't be surprised that the superintendent's um, using that same style with his or her administration administration with the principals and principals with the teachers and teachers with the students. So how we conduct ourselves and how we treat one another is supposed to be with that highest level of integrity so that it trickles throughout the entire organization with the focus being on our educators and our students. So all of this is really say conflict is, has been here in Canotillo. Conflict is not going to go away. Conflict is going to continue to happen. A team of eight, how would you propose to, to monitor yourselves, um, to create a set of agreements. Um, and we've got ours printed out. We have them right next to each trustee and we have a big poster laminated in our boardroom so that we can say, hey, number seven, or hey, I feel like we're violating the agreement. We're not really listening, or you're not using I statements. You're trying to speak for all of us. You know, this is a living, breathing document like we've described. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask you, what, what do you need? for a brave space to, to, to create a brave space in Conotillo. And love to see Patricia, if you wanna help, help push us in that direction as well. What are some agreements you'd like to propose for, for a dialogue? State. We're going to put this, we're going to put up here with your asking. What do you think you need to do space and kind of deal? I apologize if I pursue that. And if one person says, I'm not, I'm not cool with that, I'm not going to do it, um, it, it won't, it won't stay, it won't make stuff. So I want to be clear on that. Having a little trouble hearing you, Cinto. Okay, y'all can hear me? Yeah, we're good. Okay. I didn't hear all that you just said, though. Hold on. It, I, I think, it, can you unmute Patsy? Sorry, and I'll mute I myself. can't hear Patsy either. Okay. Um, I'm one of those people that that you talked about shying away from conflict and avoiding conflict. I, uh, I'm here to say that I'm one of those. I, it makes me feel uncomfortable. Maybe that's why I've been married for so many years. I don't know. Um, but, but I'm definitely one of those people that will avoid it. So how do I bring myself into that realm of the garden? Excellent question. Excellent question. Um, I think the first part is going to be um, how I, I guess to let's let's just go around the room. I'm glad you I'm glad you brought that to to you know to the forefront. Um, why don't we go around uh, to each trustee and see how do you view conflict? Do you do you do you like it? Do you not like it? Do you lean into it? Do you avoid it? So Patsy's just told us. She, she prefers to avoid it, would rather not have any conflict. Um, Blanca, where, 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 where are you at with this? How do you view conflict? Well, can you hear me? Unfortunately, in this position that we have conflict, it happens. Sometimes you cannot avoid it, but the good thing that you could do is with respect and avoid challenging, of course. I think um, he doesn't feel comfortable, to be honest. It hurts my stomach. He doesn't makes me feel good. It hurts my my health. 
my heart start to bump too much, my stomach start to twist. It's nothing good. That we are exposed to this, yes, we are exposed to this. But we need to, to do it with respect. We have to definitely and no challenge. Thank you. President Coronado, how do you view conflict? Well, you know, one of the things that that you first react to when you feel conflict is the manner of the delivery. If somebody starts to yell or you interrupt somebody to give your side without, it, it can automatically just begin conflict. So I think, you know, part of the deal is is managing the conflict because, and maybe there's another word for it, diametrically opposed positions, you know? Um, you don't say, you know, you're gonna have a uh, rifle fight if in fact you're throwing water balloons at each other. Um, so is conflicting opinions are always gonna happen but conflicting opinions is different than conflict. And so I think the way you express yourself and put forward your proposal and your opinion, the manner in which it's done can go a long ways to determine whether you're just wanting conflict or if you're really wanting a dialogue. And so I think we, you know, we do need, we've, we, the board has had some issues in, in the past with, with uh, people speaking over each other that I think we need to probably work on with um, raising voices at each other in the past that I think we need to work on. And um, I, I guess, it, you know, in that manner, that is, you know, respect number seven. Thank you. So how do you view conflict? Um, I used to be, well, I'll say this. I used to be like Patsy was. I used to avoid it. But as, as time went on and with my work experience, I've learned to be able to I just judge depending on who it is that's you know, creating the conflict and judge how it's coming at me. And that way I can be able to, like Sergio says, manage it. Uh, is it an aggressive type of conflict? Is it a personal attack or something like that? You know, that you need to judge it. You need to gauge it and manage it, but I think uh, you can, uh, if you manage it, you can lower the temperature of the conversation or the uh, conflict that's being directed at you by how you react to it. If you react in a manner that it's coming at you aggressively, then you're not going to do anything. You're not managing it. You're just talking over each other. If you listen to what they're saying and let them vent, you can lower the temperature, you can manage it and handle it and explain to them, hey, look, that's not the way to approach these things. And I think managing it is the best way, like Sergio says, you know, you need to be able to understand how that person's coming at you and manage how you're going to react. Because the bigger the, the, the conflict is going to be between two people or two groups of people. But if it's between two people, you're going to be you're going to want to be one side. And your side, you're going to have to say, you know what, time out. I'm not going to engage in this. I won't deal with it. You can go think about this. You can go cool off and come back and talk to me in a civil manner later on. Otherwise, we're not going to get anywhere. We're not going to get anything done. Trustee Searles, how do you view conflict? Pretty much like all the rest of them, I think. 
You know, I I follow suit with uh, Mr. Coronado that, you know, conflict prob- probably depends on the conflict, but I've learned it takes two to tango in life. And pretty much conflict is best dealt with, in my opinion, in my experience, with the facts. And if you've got the facts, the conflict should resolve itself. And you must have respect and decency and civility and kindness and goodness and meekness through the conflict. And you also need to remember that none of us is greater than the whole. And that's where the trouble starts. seems like that's how it works every time. Someone gets an overinflated opinion of themselves and conflict ensues. So I think that we have to all remember that we are a whole. We're a corporate body. We're not seven individuals or eight. And that really helps, makes, you know, it just makes things a lot smoother when you look at it in that aspect, is my opinion. So I think I would just agree with the rest of the board. I think that we uh, we need to handle conflict because it comes up. But it's also something to remember that it does take two to tango. And then Dr. Okay. Galavis, how do you view conflict? You know, I, I think you, you, you view conflict as an opportunity. And, and, and I like one of the concepts of controversy with civility, echoing Ms. Searles, because it really does, because you, you react to it and how you react is important. And I think um, going back to, you know, the I statements, I think as a, as a, I need to heal, you know, I, I need, cause you, you got, we got to be able to go on. And as like Tristan was saying, cause the collateral are kids and staff like so. And, and, and goes back to that parallel processing, you know, so, um, but again, I, you, you need civility because you're going back to Fort Worth's statements because you're modeling and right now we're modeling being vulnerable we're modeling uh, 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 a resolution if you will in order to go forward as, as as a team of eight so mondo how do you view conflict i guess we're in a brave space so i can't lie um i, I actually so I enjoy conflict because of time and my thought process in investing in our kids and building that capacity. I don't think we have time um, and we have the ability and should have the capacity to really, uh, I call it sometimes blow it up, but I think this educational system has an antiquated and I, I really want to look at new ideas and how we could build that capacity. So I, I also have to be true, right? Um, in regards to how do I need to grow and that civility aspect of it. Um, and that's what I'm hoping uh, with this team of eight that uh, I need to, right? I, as a I statement, I need to be uh, more professional, uh, with civility, so. Armando, you're, you're absolutely correct to, to, to call it and label it a brave space. Um, you, Canotillo, you're, you literally created a brave space right now um, to have a real conversation. And th- this can be uncomfortable, this can be vulnerable, and yet it's where the work really can get done. One more person, Tristan, how do you view conflict? And then we're going to come back to Patsy. All righty. Um, so 
I think I agree with Mr. Coronado. He said earlier that um, there can be conflicting opinions um, and conflict can arise from that, right? And I think that with conflicting opinions, conflict will rise, but it's up to us um, to negate that because you can have a uh, differing opinion with someone and not create conflict, right? Um, I myself have never been one to shy away from conflict. Um, if it comes to me, um, and I think this is what the basis of what Mr. Bayan, Mr. Galaviz were saying, um, where essentially don't rise to the conflict, you know, because cooler heads will prevail and and nothing gets done if you're just, um, I, I guess, screaming at each other, right? Nothing gets done like that. Um, and cooler heads will prevail. So if you have to leave and cool down, um, then leave and cool down, you know, um, but I've never been one to shy away from conflict just because I think sometimes that different opinions does create the best outcome. Um, and whether that be through um, meeting in the middle or, or, or conceding or, or anything, you know, um, I, I think differing opinions is necessary, especially in our positions as school board members, but I don't think conflict is necessary to get what we're going and, and to do what's best for the district and the students and staff and everyone around us. So the reason I say we come back to Patsy is if, if, we, have a, if we have a colleague who's told us, doesn't, um, sorry, I'm just gonna read you so it doesn't. Um, if you have a colleague who, and, and I've got two, two of my friends on my board who have had to get comfortable with the idea of conflict from since we've done these trainings. Um, the question is, how are you as a board, how are you as a team um, gonna be mindful and vigilant that Trustee Mendoza has, has, does not have a similar view as the rest of you? How, how do you as a board propose to be mindful of where she's at and how she is showing up? So I wanna just jump in because I'm hearing a lot of really good dialogue, right? Dialogue uh, two ways, which is really important. And I think, you know, going back to that intention versus impact and thinking about your why. When you walk in, conflict can be transformational. In fact, conflict is necessary for transformation, right? But it's how you, what is your why behind that conflict? and asking yourself that, and then recognizing that your truth is not the truth, it is your truth, and that others have a truth. Um, and so I think all of those aspects, um, as you're thinking of your agreements, just remembering that and always coming back to, what is my why? And I'm hoping your why is the students, right? Will this, will this help the students? Will this create transformation for our board so that our students succeed? And continuing to ask yourself that question um, and recognize your own positional power. I mean, there is positional power along lines of gender. You know, there's a lot of men on this board. There's some women on this board that might come back. I know I, you know, you could feel that there is age, there is experience. Those are all positions that we need to step back and say, okay, where, how am I showing up in this conflict? Not necessarily that we have to eliminate conflict because we won't have any movement, we won't create transformation, but how am I stepping into this conflict? And asking yourself that why. Anyone have an idea of, uh, in this Ms. Uh, Trustee Mendoza, by all means, feel free to chime in on how how you'd like to, in a brave space, how, how would you feel supported? How do you want to feel connected when conflict arises? I think the, the overall feeling of expressing your opinion and standing and asking yourself the why question. Um, sometimes I think because we are a board and because we are individuals, we are impassioned about our students. And I used to know this administrator that had on her screensaver, she'd say, it said, yes, but is it good for kids? 
And so I think going forward, I think we all need to ask ourselves when this type of, of uh, issue arise, arises, yes, but is it good for kids? Thank you. So, so why do we want to into the tool um, in, in, in coming up with some agreements? Patricia, anything to add? I'm sorry, I missed, I missed your first part, Cinto. Oh, um, just saying that why don't we take a dive into a tool uh, that we could, we could have for Canotillo, uh, which is to create some agreements. Uh, what do you need? What do you need uh, to, to, have a, to create a brave space uh, to, to be able to feel like you're, you're preparing the soil um, to do transformational work and continue to do transformational work? So an example is that you saw up there, like one of, we said number seven, and in other boards, they say, ouch. Uh, ouch meaning, right? <laughs> Uh, if Patricia says something that just really triggered me, all I have to do is say "ouch," and then we know that we that she and I are gonna, we're going to want to have to visit about something that you because I may not be aware at all that what I just said was offensive or hurtful to you. Uh, another district, uh, they were all men and they all were they all love football, so instead of the number seven, they said that they wanted a yellow flag, uh, yellow, and so they they made yellow cards that sit next to them at the board meeting and they raise it to say um, foul, right? You, you just said something that really, they really cut deep. And so then that's how they address it. Really what you want is to, to, to bring forth what you need to create that brave space in Canutillo to be able to fight for those student outcomes where you're attacking the idea or, or you're challenging the idea, you're not attacking the person. So what do you need? Kind of deal, and I'll, I'll I'll put them up here, and then we'll visit them after um, after we get a list, and then we'll see what makes it and what doesn't. So, um, I I think that three things that we would need to to create this this brave space um, would be one honesty, um, two respect, and and three would be empathy, to be empathetic towards the, the other person that you're speaking to. And, and just to backtrack a little bit too, I, I think empathy can go a long way in, in allowing us to move forward, you know, and not create the conflict in, in the boardroom. If you put yourself in the other person's shoes, I think that goes a long way in, in opening your mind and not being so close-minded to, to others' ideas or others' opinions, you know. And I think those are the, the three main things that we could do and I think there's obviously a lot more, right? But the three ones that are, I'm very passionate about to create the a, a brave space of growth for us. Tristan, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick on you. I'm gonna challenge you a little bit. You ready? The the you and the them. Uh, see if you can phrase those with with I statements. You know what I mean? So so try that. So go through the three words again, and then say what is true for me, my belief, my feel. You know. Try to do it that way and let's see how it comes out. Go ahead. All right. So um, <laughs> um so I, I believe that honesty would be the um for me would be the best way for the I think honesty would be the best way to create a, a brave space. And respectfulness would also be another way that I think, in my opinion, to to create the a brave space. And, and being empathetic towards towards um, my peers would also allow me to, to help build a, a brave space. Excellent work, Tristan. And, and the reason kind of feel that I proposed the I statements, it sounds more powerful because then now I'm taking ownership and what I'm willing to do versus if I'm saying, if you all are willing to do it, well, if I'd remove myself from that equation, right, then transformation won't happen. So to me, Tristan, here you say, this is what I'm willing to do, right? You're now taking ownership about what the one thing that you can control, which is you, your, your behavior and how you respond. Great job, Tristan. Thank you. Who else? What do you need for a brave space in Canutillo? When the conflict comes, what do you need?
Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Oh, I think uh, we need uh, communication. Communication with, uh, with a civil manner. I think um, when this turmoil is going on, we still need to get communicated. I still need to get communicated, but in a civil manner. Um, well, I had it already here. Tristan says, but it was respect. We have respect, of course. Um, what else? Trustee Trout, when you talk about communication, Yes. Um, with the civil manner. Yes. When you are you worried that when you don't feel like that communication is there, you do you disengage? Do you how do you how do you react yeah. to that? And yes, and uh, I'm sorry. With the communication with the civil manner, and this turmoil situation, it is going on. Of course, that I feel that it, my if I want to transmit an idea to another or my communication to the other fellow member trustee. And I feel that it doesn't go through. Mm -hmm. And I feel that it doesn't go anywhere. And I feel that my words bounce in a negative way. So what I think is, that's why I said communication in a civil manner is to understand my, my ideas. Mm -hmm. Could be, could be an idea that could be lied or not to the other trustee, but it's my idea. And I expect uh, that we could talk in the open communication bridges in a civil manner. Thank you. Yes. I have one. What about listening? I mean, when you, when, when an item is, or, or a thought or someone's feelings are expressed. Uh, I think being able to be a good listener and respect, uh, what do you call it, listening zero or listening from zero. I think that's one that we, that we need. Can I, was somebody else gonna okay go ahead was somebody oh uh, go ahead Mando. if i go okay um <clears throat> one is i think i will treat my colleagues with civility um going back to what she talked about in regards to listening um I think somehow like I will not talk while my colleagues are talking, like how do we address that issue? Um, and I, I wanna focus on building our capacity of our, of our uh, students as well as our staff and really hopefully changing the trajectory of many of our of our students, but also making sure that we make that investment. So I think one is treating with, with civility, focusing, and I guess for, for me is how, not forget, I will, how do you say something like, I'm trying to come up with a word instead of forget, uh, I will leave that behind. You know, the past is a past. How, we need to leave some of the, we need to leave that past so we could look at the future. So I'm trying to come up with something, a word, unless that works, so. Can I help you, Mondo? That will work. So leaving the past behind and pressing on towards the goal. How about that one? And the yep. goal is our students, right? Mm -hmm. And our district moving forward with that. Yeah, the, the goal, the future. Um, yeah. Our kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
that the whole I'm I'm done if anybody else wants to add some agreements. Do you think Can part we, of that, Mondo, is accepting uh non-closure? Is that you know we're not always gonna agree on everything, but we have to move forward. Yeah, we, we need yeah, exactly. I, I need to accept closure and focus on the future. Yeah, so um, I, I also agree with that too. Um, and I, I guess one more thing we could add um, that I, I think we should add is accountability. Um, and how can I create accountability for myself? You know, um, um, Cinto, similar to how you said earlier, the anecdote, you know, the story you said about um, you owning your own actions and, and how you did that, right? Uh, how can I own my own actions and how can I help myself um, and hold myself accountable? Um, may I? I think one thing that we we're hitting on is that we can write all these agreements, but when we break them or we've broken them in the past, we shouldn't say, okay, bad, bad, bad trustee. We also need to learn like, you know, in part of, for, you know, moving in the past is forgiving. When, you know, forgive yourself and forgive all of ourselves for stuff we've done in the past. You know, um, I guess one of those can be, can be is that, yeah, if we break these things, we're not gonna hold it against each one of us forever and ever. We have to learn to forgive or we're never going to move on from that. Because breaking these rules that we're going to agree on can itself cause conflict down the road when you say, oh, he, you know, we agreed on this and he's always breaking the rules. He's number seven. It's like up to 99 already. So that in itself can become a conflict and a wedge. So these, you know, while the, you know, it's great to have these agreements, but what are we going to do when these agreements get broken? And so maybe the other, the encompassing last agreement is we should learn to forgive each other, to renew that respect. I don't know. Do you believe that that comes with accepting accountability, like the? Trustee Coronado, the, you know, yes, of course, everybody's going to take missteps. Everybody, there will be instances just like uh, Cito described on his own board, but he owned it. Yeah. He owned it and moved forward, right? And, and that's true. But the word accountability to me also seems like you're getting chastised mm -hmm. or punished, which is good because you broke the rules, but there has to be a step after that. Yeah. And, and hence the reason why these are called board agreements and not board rules, uh, because agreements, they, they live. And when we violate them, we, we will ideally address them will will know versus assume. Um, I don't know if I upset Tristan when I voted against that idea he had. I don't know if I did that right. But if we have an ouch or a number seven, so to speak, now I know. And as, as a colleague of his, it might be a good idea for me to visit with him to say, hey, how are you feeling about that? Right? What came up for you? Uh, what could I have communicated better? Um, what could I have done? What did I miss, right? To create that kind of a relationship with each other. And the agreements is just for that. It's for, for, for you as a board, as a team of eight, to be able to create that, that kind of a dialogue when, when things may not go well. I, I've seen plenty of times where I've had, I didn't think we were gonna have a high conflict in our boardroom. 
I set the agenda with our superintendent and I'm walking in thinking we're going to have a great meeting. And out of nowhere, something comes in out of left field and we've got agreements. You know, if, if, if I don't feel heard, if I don't feel respected, like we, we don't, we don't let it fester. And so that's the idea with that set here. And you as the president, I'll speak from president to president, right? You model, you model the, uh, the behavior. Um, you set the tone, uh, you model the level of integrity. Um, and so if you, you know, like Mondo, Mondo, you, you took a big risk earlier um, to speak your truth and to, to address right what, what you said. This is a brave space. This is, this is, this is what I need to do. Um, that becomes somewhat contagious in a boardroom when people are, are, are owning um, some conducts or behaviors. And that usually ends up with better results for student outcomes because if we're gonna have if we're gonna have conflict today and it's about student outcomes i love that kind of conflict but if we're gonna have conflict today because of uh, a contract or we want somebody fired who we have no purview or no no power like that those are bad conflicts we we don't need those kind what you want is i think we could do better uh in third grade reading i think we could do better with our ell students like i want i want to Let's let's have that. If we're going to debate tonight, let's debate on that. Let's not debate on these other things. So, what do you need? What do you need for for the brave space for Cano Tio? Uh, Mondo, I have one. That, you know, once the decision is made by the board, that board members acknowledge that we are a team and that they support the decision made by the board. You know, a lot of times uh, a decision is made for by the board and maybe I don't agree with it, right? And uh, maybe get asked by it. And what's I think very hurtful to the board is when you come out and say they they voted on that. I I mean I I didn't want it, but they wanted it. I think that that is very detrimental on the board. But if we say um, yes, I know uh, the board the board we we voted and it passed. Period. You don't have to you know. Uh, state your personal reasons. Once the decision is made, it's made. It's done. And supporting that decision publicly. Is that? Thank you. So let's let's give these a go. Let's see let's see what makes it and what doesn't. And everyone. Um, has to say yay or nay. We can reword it if we need to wordsmith them, uh, if we need to enhance them a little bit more. This is the time. So let's begin with honesty, board uh, and, and superintendent. How how do you how are you how are you feeling about making sure that honesty is one of the one of the items on the agreements that you're going to do the absolute best to be honest as you conduct business for Cano Tio ISD. Anyone, anyone opposed to having honesty or do you want to add wording to this? If I might, um, what I, I'm thinking is <clears throat> I will be honest with myself as well as my colleagues, right? You can't be, you could say, if you're not honest with yourself, how you're going to be honest with your colleagues. But I think first identifying yourself and then be honest like right creating that brave space so i will be honest with myself and uh my colleagues how, how are you feeling about this wording board superintendent uh, i would say um i will respect my colleagues opinions i will respect my colleagues trustees opinions Can I add uh, maybe opinions and or decisions? Mm 
And or decisions, exactly. And or decisions, yes. Perfect. How are we feeling about, so let's go back to honesty. Um, anyone not liking that verbiage, anyone not willing to make that agreement, that you would like to see this and it's something that you personally are willing to adhere to? Anyone opposed to that one? No? Anyone want to change the wording on that one? And, and don't worry, because if, if, if after, you, after you practice these, you might find yourself saying, hey, we need to go back and adjust the agreement. Um, we need Can I add a brave face real quick? Go ahead. And others. Um, I, I think for, for me and I think it's important for me to be honest of what my intent is, right? Is my intent to hurt my colleague or was my intent to have, or my intent had a different idea or perception, right? So that's, uh, I think that's where I need to, and that's why I said honest, deal with myself um, to, to look at what the true intent is of some of, my decisions. Do I add a new agreement for that, Mondo? It was just a brave space. I, I'm trying to be brave okay. sometimes. Okay. <laughs> Good. Good. So what about the second one? I will respect my colleagues' opinions and or decisions. Anyone want to change wording and anyone not willing to, to agree to that? Everyone okay with this one? I have a comment. Okay. All of this is good as we write it down, but it's only as good as the piece of paper it's written on. If we don't follow these, if we don't respect these, and if we go behind our board members' backs and stab them, that's never going to be the right thing to do while you're sitting in the boardroom and everybody so oh, yes, we have all these agreements and we're going to be honest and we're going to be true and we're going to be all this. But as soon as you leave the boardroom, you're over to wherever, stabbing them in the back. That's not, that's not going to be a good outcome. So I think that it has to transcend and that we have to agree to be civil, decent, and to support one another, that there has to be an element of support in all of this. Because if we can't support one another, then that's, it's a big problem. If we're stabbing each other in the back as we walk out of the board meetings, as Ms. Mendoza said earlier, and not being a united board, there's no reason to sit through these trainings to agree to it in a training and walk out the door agree to it for a meeting and walk out the door and not follow through, not support your board member, not support your board as a unit, and not support the agreements that we've made during these trainings. Do you understand what I'm trying to convey? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and no disagreement with you there. It, yeah. And, I, I mean, and, just this past week, I've had issues of being called about this very thing happening. And so, back to the conflict issue, I've chosen to suck it up and say nothing. But that shouldn't even have had to have happened because the bad behavior shouldn't have been going on. So I think that we somehow must agree that we can't be silently and secretly stabbing one another in the back. There has to be a support system, as in every family. You don't do that to your family, and that's what we like to think of the board as, a family, a cohesive group. You can't be stabbing each other in the back. And there has to be some type of an agreement that we can agree upon to say, we will support you. We will support us. Thank you. Okay. So let me let me add that on there, um, and then let's see let's see what the board 
says. Uh, Go ahead. So I think we've got I, honesty I, I, and respect. Um, let's go with. Sinto, um, Mike. I was thinking maybe we should add on one of them inside and outside of the boardroom. Okay. Yes, Armando, that's a very good one. You know, everyone. I think um, maybe the opinion or. Cause, yeah. I, mean, I don't know. Just, can go I ahead. Add something? Guys, we also have to remember that the way we look at being a elected official on the board, to me, is way different than being a different kind of elected official. And we know how dirty elections get, campaigns and all that. Is we have to remember because, you know, I saw some of it this last election is telling outright, you know, exaggerations about current sitting members on the board from each other. You know, I view this service as a board member as something akin to running as a judicial campaign. You know? Um, we should be straight down the middle and shouldn't be out there espousing um, just, just exaggerations about what either the board has done or a particular board member has done. You know, we should have more ethics than, you know, other officials. We're entrusted with students education, period. And that's how we're going to go out and model for them to act by exaggerating and deriding and just flat out, you know, characterizing uh, actions of the board as horrible or a particular board member. Um, we need to be better than that. We ought to be better than that as trustees. I mean, it's in our name. I agree, President Coronado. It is so, our name. The third one we have on the list now, based on this conversation, is I will support my colleagues inside and outside of the boardroom. Um, anyone not willing to agree to this or anyone want to propose verbiage to be changed on this? Oh, so I'm, I'm trying to look at something and <laughs> looking at some of my notes from one of the conferences. What I, I think I will empathize with uh, my colleagues and I think what we need to do is like reach that olive branch, right? And try to understand and appreciate. Uh, and support them and support. Yeah. Well, trying to understand and, and, you know, trying to understand whether it's culture, trying to understand your colleague outside of the boardroom, right? Like, what you could say triggers, but how do you understand? You, you all get where I'm coming from? Mm -hmm. How about I will respect my board members, my colleagues in and out of the boardroom? We had it already, right? Well, we it already. I, well, I think what, what Lori was saying is that we do it in here, but then we go out and start just talking behind each other. There's one that um, Fort Worth has, because I hear a lot about intent and impact and owning the words. Don't just write them down, but live the words, right? In inside the boardroom and outside the boardroom. And 
One that I like that Fort Worth has uh, on theirs is I model the behavior that we expect of the students we serve, that you are modeling the behavior of your, that you want your students to see. Um, how does that feel? Does that feel like kind of the elimination of that inside outside of the boardroom? I like inside outside. So the third one. What I like is what Ms. Pat Patricia said. Maybe we could add it as another point. It's another bullet point. It's a good, it is a good point, maybe. I, I have, I, I think the last one uh, would be, could be incorporated into, I will respect and respect. support my colleagues my, my, inside and my, outside of the boardroom to include decisions made by the board. There you go, Patsy. And that would eliminate the last one, right? Mm-hmm. I will respect and support my colleagues. And I think two and three are sort of the same. Include decisions made. I think, Patsy, I think yours is a little bit different because it's acknowledging the final decision. Right. I think this is... You think it needs its own bulletin? I, I would take... This is I statement, right? Mm -hmm. I would take out support, and I think it's important to respect. Right. And, and merge two and three, right? I mean, that's pretty much what. We could give it a do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Let's leave it for now, and I think we could probably. Both of them later. Um, anyone, anyone not willing to agree to one, two, and three so far? So the, the part of the reason why this is tedious as well is because we're investing time uh, on our on the board to be clear mm -hmm. with one another, to be mm -hmm. clear that, that the, this is what we need, these are the agreements. And so we can spend time on it. Uh, and if you violate That's that, until we can't hear you again. Sorry, okay. Um, the reason we're spending time on this and, and being tedious with the verbiage and the, and the wording is because you're putting this together and you all have made notion that, that there are gonna be violations of the agreements. Um, and so when it happens, you'll remember the time spent to put these on paper. Uh, and so that's the reason I'm, I'm, I'm asking, like, are you all in agreement? Anyone not okay with one, two, and three? Uh, it's, it's important for us to know because if you're not okay with it, we need to change it now or we need to eliminate them, so. Everyone in agreement with one, two, and three so far? Yes, sir. Okay. So the next one, Mondo, you kind of jumped at it. Um, I will empathize with each of my colleagues. I, I think what, what I'm trying to say is like, I will appreciate my colleagues' identity and and work on, I don't know, healing, not healing. I, I will work on- Because Tristan brought up empathy. Yeah. No, I think the empathy, I'm just saying, what I'm trying to add is you empathize with your colleague, but you, you wanna understand and appreciate their identity too and what they're able to bring to the table whatever that may be. I right? agree with you, Armando, that we all have certain gifts and we all have very special abilities and we should respect and be happy with that, that we all bring something wonderful to the table. Our experience, yeah, I agree with you completely. Maybe I will empathize with each other. What was the other phrase, Mando? says uh, 
recognize or what do you say? Un understand yeah. and appreciate your colleague's identity, even if it differs from yours, right? Like we got to mm -hmm. understand that we all bring something to the table, whether it's youth, whether it's uh, female, male, whether it's, uh, you know. Oh, uh, oh okay, I understand. Whether it's our own experiences, right? Like mm -hmm. we've had experiences within our families, within the educational system. So we got to understand why you might be triggered for something compared to my trigger, right? Like I, I might get in a conflict because I don't, I don't want to waste time. And there's certain issues that maybe you have had to, um, that you've gone through mm -hmm. in the district that you're like, you know, this is, you know, uh, why I look at these issues, right? Yeah. It could so range from student outcomes to, uh, we're going to be seeing a lot of mental health issues, right? So mm -hmm. uh, I think our, our own experiences within our life or even within our the educational system, we need to understand that. Like, what is it that Blanca wanted to run? What is it that Lori wanted to run? What is it that Sergio Patsy? And how do we respect that, but understand that? Uh, yeah. grow, grow as an individual uh, and a better understanding of our colleagues on the board. We empathize with each of my colleagues. So, so, so far, let, let, let me stay in order, Mondo. I will empathize with each of my colleagues. It was Tristan who brought it up first, right? And then you've, you've ex expanded it. Um, um, anyone, uh, anyone not want that on there? In that, I will empathize with each of my colleagues. I do understand this for several things that we need. Yeah, I'm willing to empathize, but can we add the word, because I don't see the word in anywhere, support. I will empathize and support and support, um, I don't know, one another or my colleagues, or I would like to see the word support. It is very important that we feel support from one another. And I think it might feel Good in this phrase, I will empathize and support one another or my colleagues in whatever they they do identify with. Can I throw some out there? Sure. I mean, I like the word support, but maybe support should be in in supporting the decision of the entire board. The decision? Because, because we're not going to you know, if we say we're going to support each other, well, then we're not going to have disagreements about things because we can say you're not supporting me. Um, you know? But if well, we say, but we say, I will empathize. Support, and I think what you're ser searching for and everybody's searching for is the word respect really cap captures a lot of this. Mm -hmm. right? The word respect captures a lot of this. It captures all of it. It I will empathize and support. If you respect somebody, you respect their opinion. You respect where they come from. You respect their, their identity. Yeah. You respect their Yeah, but I do respect. understand respect, but also it's very important that we feel support because sometimes when we need to come to an agreement, we need to we need to be supported by sometimes, you know. Well, I think I think the board needs to be supportive of the ultimate decision that, that the board makes. Yes, very, very. So then the board support we eliminate it from this. Well, that's kind of like what Cinto was saying. The whole thing that brought us about was civil. What was it, Cinto? Civil. Controversy with civility. If we support each other on everything we say, well, no, of course we're not. Gonna, not. We're not going to be. No, but of course we're talking about to empathize. I mean, empathize it says trying to, to be positive, right? Yeah. Or maybe maybe the word is to be positive. Empathize and to be positive. With the positive view, with the, to be positive. Well, but let me let me tell you, Blanca. Uh, mm -hmm. The way I look at it is, 
what, what if we are having a discussion about whether to go with one thing or another or one mm -hmm. idea or another and you're arguing no that's not the right way to go and i say no yeah this is the right because of this this and that and can we see that with a positive lens maybe well that could be you know you're going to classify you know, both things as positive but there's there they're kind of, with a positive view maybe they're opposites i, I would empathize and be positive but, but they, they're differing opinions so, so it could be with a positive view for example i will empathize empathize and see with a positive view i i mean no? we, we could but we're getting into real okay I'm, eliminated then I'm eliminated just yeah respect mm -hmm. each other you respect each other's opinions I mean, I like. I think it's more than enough. I like okay, that's fine. Uh, we eliminated that. That's because, okay. Because, you know, they're easy. They're, they, you know, the 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 less wordage we can make on these, the better we're going to be able to remember. Yeah, that is true. Okay, that's fine. It might it might we'll position. Empathize with each of because my colleagues. You know, um, I like Fort Worth the ones that they have that are really short because they're easy to ingrain in your thoughts and in your actions. Yeah, you know, it's mm -hmm. like the last, the last of them that Fort Worth does says, I stay engaged. I mean, my thought was I will participate, but that, that really captures it. Not just, you know, engaging, engaged. well, I don't have to be engaged by saying something, but I'm engaged in the discussion. I, I, I hear the viewpoints, I'm listening, mm -hmm. I'm engaged in it. And I'm listening. I, or I speak out. I'm still. I'm engaged in it. So it's a little more broad. Uh, of of more things that you do. I speak. I'll stay engaged and listen. I um, or, and or, listen. Or, may I interject because this is getting into. Yeah. I I, I think of, ouch one I think one is I will stay engaged in and my listen conversation. Yeah, like I think. That is part of the respect part, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think sometimes we blown each other off, but I think stay engaged and listen to the my colleagues' opposing views or something. Yeah, As guys, I, can I ask you all one question? Of sure. everything that we've said, our ideas that have been proposed, what have we said that is not captured but why Fort Worth has put on here? Well, I think we're yeah, trying to. Yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm. If it worked for them, why do we reinvent the wheel? I, or, or you just use your code of ethics. I no, I think the, the, the this code is of important. ethics says I will All tell the truth. But I to, will share my views while working for consensus. Dr. G, but to be account to acknowledge, I am accountable for my actions. That's, that's what your code of ethics says. I, mm -hmm. yeah. I right. will tell the truth. Right. Mm -hmm. right. I will share my views while building consensus. I will be fair, just, and impartial in all my decisions and actions. I will accord others with, with respect I wish for myself. I will encourage expressions of different opinions and listen with an open mind to others' ideas. You know, the only one I don't see on there that Fort Worth has got, Dr. Galavis, and I really like this one, I acknowledge I am a part of a team. Amen. It's the last one on Fort Worth. Amen to that one. Amen. Yeah, it's a good one. Because if you don't play as a team, and I'm hardly a sports person, but it never goes well. I can see that with the Cowboys. Look what happened. Sorry, Dr. Galavis, I know how you feel about them, but... You know, if you don't play as a team, it's not going to work. If you got one spoke out of the wheel that's loose, every one of us has had a bicycle at some point. You know, it never works very well when that one spoke isn't going well. And if two are out, well, it really works even worse. So I like that. I acknowledge I'm part of a team. We should add that to our code of ethics. I think maybe bringing the code of ethics with this, but I think 
what we're also doing is building our capacity and our our agreements within ourselves. So I think we've had the code of ethics that hasn't worked. And I think this is what we're trying to do is make something work. So uh, whether we in, work with our code of ethics in this, but I think it's important for us to do this work. Can I ask a question? Absolutely. Mando. Yes, sir. Why hasn't the ethics code of ethics worked? I think we haven't had. I, review? My, yeah, I, I, one is a review. And I think we've just pushed it aside. We haven't been honest, right? With our Why? own selves. And what's to say that this will happen to this thing here also? Well, we're supposed to have a process in place to say when one of this happens, then we say, ouch, and, or whatever it may be, right? And we try to take a step back and address this. It's, it's, it's professional development that I think, yeah. I'm hoping will allow us to grow and hopefully address some of the past behaviors that we've had. Okay. So I think working with both, I think we've gotten some good ideas, but I think our code of ethics might be, uh, we might be able to work with both of us, but we haven't, our code of ethics have not been changed since I've been on the board 15 years and I don't think we've ever had that discussion, right? So I think this is healthy in regards to now we know what that is and now hopefully we could have that uh, behavior changed and that accountability and i'm hoping it's a different process right okay so um can i can i jump in real quick um so i do agree with mr payan and i would like to know why it didn't work in the past and and i would like to know everyone's opinion on, on why why the code of ethics and why would the system before did not work so we know what to change and, and make more efficient, you know? Um, and also in regards to our, what Armando said, I, I think I agree with making something and, and moving forward, right? If it didn't work, let's find out what didn't work with the last system and, and implement it in this one, right? But I think we do need to identify what the problem was and what the problems were. Um, but also um, my own opinion, I, I think that we've gotten a little off topic in regards to the agreements that we have. We have 15 agreements. And if I'm being completely honest with you guys, like I'm not going to, I can't remember all these, you know, we have, I think we have to, my brother always tells me this, right? Kiss. He tells me to kiss. It's keep it. And I'm not calling anybody anything. Right. But the, 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 the acronym is simple. So stupid. And that's something that I, I myself live by where if it's 15 things, I'm not going to want to remember them. Right. Where I think we should have it, maybe limited to a handful of things that embodies everything we have on this page. Um, so that way it's, it's easy to remember, it's easy to um, abide by, and it's easy to, to say, hey, you're not following number five, as opposed to, hey, you're not following number 14, you know? Um, and, and I think that we need to, to focus it instead of adding more stuff, I think we need to limit it first and, and condense the list we have um, before we continue moving, because I think we're getting a little bit um, off topic in regards to continuing adding, adding, adding. I think we need to to limit it and make it more efficient before we can keep condense to condense this information that we get to make it less. If, if I might add, Mr. Payan, I think that might be one of the issues is that there's been too many, right? There's a list. Yeah. You look at it, and I think maybe it, we should now. And I think what Fort Worth has seven either we do seven or we do five, uh, but I, I, I think. You know, because one of the things that the code of ethics promulgates is really common, respectful conduct, which we in large part adhere to. Do we need to review it and, and say, uh, we need to emphasize as board members adhering to some of these code of ethics bullet points. 
But, you know, the code of ethics really is a common code of conduct that we all need to adhere to. And a lot of these things that we're adding here is part of the code of conduct in some way, shape, or form. So, and I agree with uh, Tristan, you know, who's going to be, during a board meeting, who's going to be looking at these 14, 15, or maybe 10, or, okay, if we bring it down to five, I can see that. But unless it's so egregious a conduct, a misconduct by a board member and, and, and violating some of these bullet points here, then I'll go, go back and say, okay, let's look at those agreements we had. You know, uh, I don't know. Yeah, it, I, feel, I feel compelled to share with you where this came from and this originated. Um, in, my, in my previous life, I was a juvenile probation officer and a gang interventionist. Uh, agreements is the way we would create peace in the community with young people and gangs. Yeah. And so I tell you frankly and honestly, the skill sets that the interventions, you know, to, to, to bring a sense of community, comunidad, began with agreements. It's, it's tribal. It's, it's, it's part of the indigenous ways, right, to, that my word has to mean something. And so if, if my, what I need for, for me in my boardroom is reflective in, in our Fort Worth agreements, everybody's agreements look different. And there's, there's a reason for that because every district is unique in its own way. Every, do you have every, a code of conduct every, in it? Yeah, we do. And, and quite honestly, it's just the same as I said. Um, do, you, do any of you know what your, value, what, your, what your core values are for Canotillo? These are documents, right, that are, that are developed prior to, to some of us, but they're not owned by me. The agreements are owned by, by, by myself and my eight other colleagues. That's different. Yeah, you know what I mean? So it's different when, when I know that there's a vision and a mission statement and core values, but I had nothing to do with the development of those. So I don't own them. Here, I own our agreements. And when I violate them, I am violating my own self. It's the integrity conversation that you're going through with Lone Star Governance. Yeah. My integrity that I'm violating, I put it on paper. I spent two hours on a, on a Wednesday night developing this. That is my word that's on this document. And that, that to me speaks through my ancestors uh, it, that they come forth with me and that, that I don't want to violate these agreements anymore. So when I do violate them in Fort Worth, it's personal now. I, I made an investment. And so when my colleague says, Cinto, you hurt my feelings and, and here's, here's the number seven and here's why, I now have a higher sense of responsibility to go make it right. Because I have to say, I did, I made an agreement to that. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry. I am so sorry that I hurt you, that, 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 that I, 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 I broke my word. I hurt you. It's not what I wanted. That was not the, the intention. Um, it, and what it does is it, it, create, it keeps a brave space intact because you own it and you keep it living versus a document or a book or, or a poster that I have nothing to do with. So um, can, I, can I clarify and then recommend something as well? Um, so just to clarify, because um, so the code of conduct and the mission statement, everything, you say we don't touch them, right? They, they were done before us, and I agree. Um, so to clarify, I think that's like the, the framework, right? The ground. And, and to make it more personable to us, I think that's what the point of the agreements is, correct, Cinto? Absolutely. It's, it's, okay. to it's and, for um, self-governing. Mm -hmm. and, and, and just a recommendation, um, I, I, this is kind of off topic, you know, but is there any way we can get uh, how, how Sal recommended, you know, a, a review of, of the code of ethics, you know, um, in addition to what we're doing now? And I, I don't mean to do it like today, right, because um, I think that would take a while. There's nothing prepared to my knowledge. Um, is there any way that, that we can get a, a review of the code of ethics just so that we're all aware of, of the baseline we have set, right? Um, uh, on top of what we're going to agree to individually with, with these agreements. Is, is, that, is that possible to get the, to get the review of the code of ethics? I, I'm going to say, I'm going to look to your board president, right? That that is, um, that is going to be, a, you know, this is what I love about dialogue. Yeah. That, we, that what's, what's been brought forth now is we may have to have a review of our code of ethics. Yeah, I think right? so. Because also, I mean, the Constitution of the United States was was there before us. The Ten Commandments was there before us. 
there has to be a certain decorum that that's universal truth. And so to continue and hash out verbiage is just verbiage because every foundation of a team has to have trust. Because if you keep saying inside, outside the boardroom, you just say, hey, the restroom too. So you're, you're getting into, you know, just too much. I mean, you gotta believe and trust that whoever's by your side and what we're doing is that you're going to, again, I will be fair, just, and impartial in all my decisions and actions. That's code of ethics. Well, yeah. It was here before you, before you were born, Tristan. But, you know, honor thy mother and father. Yeah. You know, um, I think it's important I, to remember that in, in, or in thinking through this, and I, I, would, I would wonder what your thoughts around that is. Sometimes when we talk about the code of ethics, that that is a personal document. That's a, a holding myself accountable to a, a standard uh, and, and in these agreements, I wonder, and just by hearing your dialogue, when we talked about conflict and we talked about all of the things, um, you know, that were, there were challenges for you in the boardroom is this document is a place for relational, like, how are we going to show up for each other? This is a relational document, whereas the code of ethics stands alone, more personal. That's, I would I'd just be curious to think, you know, to hear how you guys uh, think about that. Well, I agree that we, we ought to review our code of uh, ethics or our code of conduct. Um, and we should probably do that every time that there's a new makeup in the board. Every couple of years is a good time to do it when there's an election. Um, and right now is Mr. As good Coronado, as we're supposed to do it once a year by policy. And we have been. We just did that in September, October, if you all remember. I know, but we really didn't. I recall going through that, but did we really recall going through it with a... Uh, I agree. With rigor? the new board. Yeah, I understand. But we did yeah. do it. We checked the box. Yeah, but it is a, box, an annual but... thing by policy. And I think that we need to be a little more, um, what do you call it, practical about when we do it. We did it right before an election. And we have two new board members. Do you know? We, we need to think about how we're, we're doing these things. And so I, is it great to do that? Yeah, it's also in timing. So I think we should review those. And I think uh, it's good that we're talking about this because you know, this isn't just reviewing them. Okay, everybody's okay with it. Yep, all right, let's go. You know, um, it's good to hash these things out because if we don't, it makes it a lot easier for us. If we put thought into it, it's gonna make it harder for us. We really delve in, inside of us because if we don't, we're going to be just very great and just being passive about not paying attention to them. That's probably been the problem. And I think this is one good way of paying attention to them. That's my, that's my thought. We're three and a half hours in my friends and one, and, and we can see why we can have challenging board meetings when we have good dialogue. No. And we're, we're trying to come to a common ground and understanding this is this is not easy, right? So people that want to run for the board might want to watch these kinds of meetings to see that it, it can be fun, it can be good, it can be healthy. So to Tristan's point, Tristan, you made an excellent point to, to, to maybe narrow this down, to maybe uh, eliminate some of it. Um, what, what I'm tempted to do is say, leave this in the hands of President Coronado to, to continue the conversation or we can, or we can push through and get this finalized tonight. But I'm, I'm looking to the board to see what your thoughts are. I, I think that's an excellent idea that we have a meeting to review this. And there's probably other things we also need to review, especially some things in policy. So, um, I, I would also yeah. recommend to, to bring back leadership ISD to help us yeah. in this dialogue. 
Yeah. It's bring, nice when you have. Bring, bring uh, Leadership by SD back again. I mean. I was thinking they were going to be our life coach from here on out. Well, they are. <laughs> yeah, I like it. We've had yeah, a good I, training tonight. I like this better than a lot of the other yes. teams we've done. Mm-hmm. I agree. You know? So. Yeah, and if we keep it consistent, we'll be consistent. Yeah. Instead yeah. of a shotgun blast, let's have the rifle, you know, the straight shot, and keep it consistent. I hope the board feels it sounds like y'all do feel like I do. I like Thank you, Jacinto. And the other thing we can do is, you know, it, we're required to have three hours. We're not limited. <laughs> yeah, and, and I, didn't any, I didn't see anywhere in TASB or uh, TEA's deal that it's, yep, three hours are up. That's it. Done. <laughs> I think you're out of here. Mr. No. Chair, Mr. Ramos, yeah. I think well, we should come to an agreement to how many we want to narrow it down to is it three is it four is it i think no more the than ten seven. commandments I, I think no more than seven uh but uh i think we could narrow these down and let's come to that agreement first and if we want to do it tonight i'm okay with that or we could come back and say okay we need to narrow these to whatever that number is how so. about how about if we let uh, myself and Cinto get together on, on bringing a synthesis of these for a proposal to the board? We have another powwow and have leadership Tasby come back again uh, to hash this out because you know it's important. The behavior of the board is important. But did I did I did I catch that right, Cinto? They said these are based on gangs. Are you calling us a gang of eight? <laughs> um, I knew you were going to go there. I knew it. It, it. That's why I was hesitant to tell you where it came from. And so I will tell you my I statements of how how I view this work from working with boards with it within my own board, the state and national level. Um, I'm going to speak for what's true for me. I adopted a, a gangster monster um, set for a while and I lowered my integrity and I regret it. I regret it. I conducted myself for another. We're not hearing. Can you? We're not hearing you. We need to. Yeah. Oh. Sergio, can you mute? I think. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Sorry. What I was saying is that my I statement is I violated my integrity so much in my in my first term, and I admit that to my colleagues, to my community, because I came in with a, a gangster mindset after I was hurt. There were decisions made in the boardroom without me, and I wasn't included. Uh, and I thought I'm gonna I'm gonna find ways to get power because I'm and I justified it by saying I'm fighting for kids, and so I noticed a pattern not only in myself but in my colleagues but also in my colleagues around the state and around the country. And so when leadership ISD when we said we we want to flip this team of eight we don't want to do traditional team of eights, you know my experience from having been in a war room and having a battlefield mindset and sometimes competitive mindset, the the cost was heavy. The, 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 the benefits were that I was winning. I was, getting, I was getting agenda items passed, right? So I felt like I was winning. I got turf in, in the schools. I got all these things that I wanted to get done. But the agreements that we created as a board are the living document that now I've created a sense of accountability for myself and my colleagues have as well. And when we violate them, like I was saying earlier, I have to take ownership and it hurts. And I have to acknowledge that me hurting other colleagues is hindering the student achievement outcomes that we want. And so if, 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 if a board can work together with a superintendent uh, and, and, and be focused on student outcomes, what we believe to be true is that they'll get better. And we'll minimize time focused on adult behaviors and, and misbehaviors, and we can focus more time on monitoring student outcomes and supporting the superintendent. And Dr. Galavis, holding the superintendent accountable as well. So yes, long, long winded Sergio, um, the same techniques that work in the streets with young people seem to kind of be working with adults in school board rooms. Amen. So I, I, I guess what I'm gonna do is um, I'm gonna get to, to, to wrap up and then hand it back over to you. Um, I'm gonna open a space for my colleague Patricia 
uh, thoughts before we go to the one word checkout? No, I think this was really good dialogue. I think just even the act as you have all uh, been able to experience tonight, the act of actually trying to put in paper how you want to treat each other, how you want to be seen, how you want to model board behavior, that's an important step towards creating the kind of transformation you want for your students. So I appreciate the work that you're doing and I know it's not easy, but uh, it's necessary. So I applaud you. Thank you, PA. Uh, my friends, the reason we focus on the feeling word in the trainings is because the feeling, is, the feeling zone is the transformation zone. If I, if I see my colleagues as people to be invested in versus objects to be moved, transformation is happening. And the, the data points tend to get better when boards function as a team. Um, don't always have to agree. Remember, I'm not promoting artificial harmony. I'm not saying you ought to be having unanimous votes. You absolutely ought to be able to vote your conscience and based on your values, because that's part of the reason why you're here uh, to represent your community and the vision. Uh, so the feeling, that's the reason why we do that. I uh, want to do a one word checkout and how you're feeling right now. Uh, and then if you want to elaborate on it a little bit, please feel free to do so. So I'll say who wants to start us off and then in leadership ISD, we popcorn. So, um, Trustee Mendoza, you're going to start us off, and then when you're done, you're going to pick somebody. Okay. I feel productive. Three and a half hours, and I feel like we accomplished something. We all know how we feel, and I'm going to popcorn this to Ms. Trout. Okay. I feel positive. I feel we already accomplished a lot of things in three hours. So, and I feel that we already bond more. So I'm gonna pick um, Sergio. Thank you, Blanca. Thank you, Patsy. I'm trying to search for a word, but I think, you know, um, I, I think the word I'm feeling now is comfortable. You know, I, I know we haven't in the past felt completely comfortable the way we have been. But I think, uh, like, like you said, hopeful and productive leads to being, you know, happy and comfortable serving. So I, I, I feel very, uh, like I said, hopeful that we are going to come together. Um, I miss it from some of the early times when I've uh, served on the board. Literally, it is a absolute wonderful feeling to be able to uh, debate and then to go out and socialize as a unit and feel that we're appreciated, the entire team of eight. It's just a very comfortable feeling to be around. So I'm hoping we can get there. And now popcorn to uh, Tristan. Okay, so I guess one word I would use to describe today's um, training would be fruitful um, in that I, I think that we did learn a lot. And I think that uh, a comment I would like to make is, um, uh, I, I think that we had in, in regards to um, the debate and all the, the three um, discussions you put on, I think we had a very good growth um, um, debate today. Not only that, it was a good dialogue. I think there, were, there was no um, discussion happening from either like one person where just one person was, was lecturing to all of us. I, I think that we were all very open to each other's opinions when formulating the agreements. Um, and I think we had a very good dialogue today, very good productive um, fruitful dialogue. Who are you popcorning to, Tristan? Um, forgot I was popcorning. <laughs> um, I'll go ahead and shoot it to um, uh, Mondo. I'm stuck between healed and healing. Probably more like healing. I think uh, this is 
something that we need to move so we could heal and and move forward and focusing on on what an impact we could have on kids and i have to popcorn uh is Lori or Sal? Uh, I'll pop can, popcorn to Miss Searles. So I feel time well spent. And a big smile. You all can't see me, but you, you can hear my voice. Big smile. So I have a smile and feel time well spent. And I very much, I, I truly thank you, Cinto. Excellent job uh, on a hard rock that we've needed to have broken. Thank you. And I'll popcorn to Sal. Did you all hear me? We did. He's, he's unmuting. Okay, because my battery on my phone went out, I have to tell you all, as long as we're being very, very open and honest. I miss what Miss Trout said in the beginning of Tristan's. We've been on the phone so long, the battery went, that I had to go find another phone and call back into the meeting. I'm so sorry. Yeah, my, my laptop died too. So. Oh, no. Okay, I don't feel any guilty <laughs> that Tristan. <laughs> Um, Here you are, Mr. Okay. No, I, I've, I, I'd like to really say, yeah, we, I heard some comments that made me, like Mando said, there's some healing going on. And, and that's good. I feel good about that. And uh, I also heard some uh, comments that uh, I think uh, acknowledge that we've had we have to move forward and we have to do these things to be able to really work as a team. And uh, I think it opened up a, uh, I, I want to say, can I create a, a great space here and say, <laughs> I, I like those comments about debate and discussion and conflict and all of that, but and uh, I'm going to say, in reviewing the code of conduct, the code of ethics. And I agree that it's something that we have failed to do consistently. And I think we need to do it more often than once a year, because in effect, that's what we're doing. We shouldn't have to be reminded as adults that we have to be honest, that we have to be truthful, that we have to be acknowledging each other. We're adults. And being the oldest one, maybe I'm scolding everybody and saying, you know what, why do we have to be reminded to do these things? We're adults. We're supposed to be modeling what we want our kids to do. Mr. Galavis brought up the code of conduct. Recite one of them, Mr. Galavis. I will be fair, just, and impartial in all my decisions and actions. Why do we have to be reminded and go through all of this to be able to do that? The seven commandments tells us. We learned that in catechism. Mm -hmm. We did. But I think if we have to, let's review it. Let's go back and say, hey, maybe Sergio, once a month, hey, bring up one of those code of conduct uh, points. As part of the opening comments and in, in, in our meetings. But again, that's my brave space there. So thank you. And I agree. Uh, if we can condense those seven or 10 or 14 points, I'm all for it. I like seven. Members. That, leaves, that leaves Dr. Galavis. I think uh, it, it's, a, it's a start. And every journey and every team starts from somewhere. So it's now, as Mr. Payan was saying, now it's up to us as the adults and you as elected officials have to come together and, and uphold these gangster agreements or code of ethics or whatever. But, but again, it's, you're dealing with the human being. It's a, a human being is a very simple but complex Hence, simplicity, animals. So, 
bless you all and be safe and healthy. Thank you, Dr. G. Thank you, all of you guys. You're Thank welcome. You. Thank you, Ms. Patricia. It was excellent yeah. training. Patricia, what's your one word checking out tonight? Oh, I think it's um, anticipation. I'm, I'm anxious to see where, if we can put actions into our words. Yeah. The Heinz ketchup commercial. Amen. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my friends, my, mine is humbled to be able to spend time with amazing human beings. Um, you all did tremendous, tremendous work. The brave space that you created tonight, uh, the humility that I see in you, uh, and the passion that you have for the students in your community of Canotillo. So I tip my hat and, and mad respect, as the young people say. I got mad respect for you. <laughs> <laughs> so appreciate your time. Handing this back over to you, President Coronado. Thank you so much. Thank you, Patricia, and thank you, Cinto. Uh, guys, how about uh, how about a great round of applause to our two uh, trainers uh, this evening? Uh, Definitely. Excellent. On behalf of uh, of the the entire gang of eight of Canutillo ISD. Uh, Cinto and Patricia, we thank you from the bottom of, my, of our hearts uh, on behalf of our community and mostly our students that we should be focused on. Uh, thank you for guiding us in trying to become a united uh, board. Uh, not a uniform board, but a united board. And we thank you for that. We would like to invite you back to finish some of this. Like we said, you know, we don't have to have three hours a year and that's it. Actually, this is probably some of the most productive stuff that we can, that, that can help us in doing our work, sure. you know? So yeah. I think we should do something in the summer again, or we'll look yeah. forward to see when we can do this again. In the meantime, um, Cinto and I will get together on honing on these uh, proposals for our agreements. Um, and I want to also uh, tell you that next board meeting will be next uh, Tuesday. 26? Is that Tuesday? Yes, or the 26th. Right. And it will be both. Uh, it's posted now, I believe, everybody. And it's going to be both uh, in person and virtual. We seem to have gotten clearance from uh, TASB Legal and our attorney. Uh, I sent the letter off to the governor and never heard back. Um, I will follow through on that. I will see everybody on Tuesday. A great big hug to each and every one of you. Um, happy inauguration day. And I will see everybody next uh, Tuesday. Hopefully everybody stay safe. And have a good evening. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Good training. You know, Just one other thing before we leave. Move to adjourn. One, one thing before we leave. Um, you know, all, all these things about focusing on all these, how we, you know, relate to each other. We really, you know, need to take one more step forward and, and saying, what is it that we are trying to get our teachers to teach our kids? Hmm? Is it, are we trying to pack, you know, ill-packed and ill-organized information into their heads that sometimes, you know, that they may not use ever? It should be one of our focuses that we build their character, you know? I disagree with this, and a lot of, you know, we would disagree with this, uh, but maybe, you know, we're, we're working on the character of the board, and we must be mindful that we also want our kids, we want to model this, and that's in some of these agreements as these other boards have. We model these, we want to model ourselves, be models to our kids, but, you know, let's start asking our kids, what is it that they feel they need? We need to send out a survey to them to to find out what it is, what do they think about us as their board, their superintendent, their teachers. We need to do that. And we need to 
also make sure that we are teaching in these, you know, to be have good character traits like we want for our board. So with that. Board another... President, I'm sorry, before you adjourn the meeting, uh, housekeeping, we have not posted that agenda yet. A legal gave us the verbiage very late in the afternoon, so we could not post, but we will post first thing tomorrow morning and deliver tomorrow morning. All right, everybody. So we will post tomorrow morning yeah, and then everything will be delivered tomorrow, uh, sometime tomorrow to everybody. Yes, sir. Uh, I stand corrected. Thank you, Sonia. Yes, sir. But we did work on this. Uh, and actually, since last week, Dr. Galavisan had been working on getting this uh, resolved. And um, it's a good thing that we did. Yes. So everybody, good evening. Good night. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Bye, everyone. Have a nice evening. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye.